All right, everyone, who's ready for some weird stuff today? So we're gonna look into um, some CPU side effects. So I'm gonna take a look at, uh, let's grab, uh, let's grab Fuego Fox here. And we're gonna search for uh, Skylake UART diagram. And the first thing that shows up is my blog, but I can make that work. Uh, <laughs> There we go, we can do this. That was actually a relatively fast way of finding it. Okay. So effectively what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna try to observe all traffic to load ports on Intel processors. And that's a relatively difficult problem. Um, so not only do I want to observe the data that's going across the load port, I also want to sequence it. And when I say I want to sequence it, I want to know the order of which the loads occurred. Um, so instead of just knowing the data or randomly sampling data or trying to figure out what's flying across the bus at a given time, I actually want to go to like a cycle by cycle level. And in fact, I need to go sub cycle. I need to go to half a cycle, um, since you can do two loads per, per cycle. So I want to basically, uh, this is the goal and, and we're working in very, 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 very undefined behavior here. So, um, there's a chance a lot of this won't work, but the goal will be today that I'll have like a graph where on the X axis, it will be number of cycles. If I do, uh, if I open up GIMP, um, effectively the goal today will be to have a graph that looks like, uh, this, and this will be like time and cycles. Oh yeah. And then this will be the like uh, frequency. Frequency. And then what I effectively want to do is this is going to be on the order of like one, two, let's say this is like a hundred cycles, not to scale, of course. Um, that might be too big of a brush, but whatever. It, it's fine. Uh, effectively, what I want to build is a histogram that shows some what I'm expecting will be normal curves with a lot of overlap, with a lot of overlap. In fact, it might be really difficult to, we're going to be doing probably a lot of stats here. Um, and what I want is that these peaks will get labeled. Now I can change the brush size. We'll do like, that's fine. And then I want these peaks to be labeled with like OX123. Oops, and uh, font size, like 18, okay. And I'll do that here, so I would want like, that would be one, two, three, and this is A, B, C, D, E, F, apparently, and then leap. And this would hopefully, uh, due to this like histogram, these normal distributions, hopefully we could find statistically significant uh, delineations between these lines. And if we can, uh, between these peaks, in fact, uh, I don't know why that's not drawing. That's really strange. Oh, it's because I have that box selected. Okay. So if we could like draw these lines of significance, we could hopefully use that to basically determine um, this value was red first and it was likely red at this cycle count, whatever that is. And this value is likely red at this cycle count. And then this value is red likely at this cycle count. Um, so there's no way, there's no way in hell that we're going to be able to actually get this information in a stream and like read these three things sequentially. So everything that we're gonna be doing here is gonna be many attempts with like statistical significance and the binning in these histograms. And the question is how clear are these histograms? I'm guessing the very first thing we attempt to write, they're not going to be clear at all. Then we're gonna go to a second stage and we're gonna try and clean them up or maybe do some tricks to delay things. Maybe we'll turn on some uh, like CPU uh, frequency scaling stuff to intentionally slow down the processor uh, to hopefully make the like the peaks of these, um, the peaks of these standard distributions. They might not be standard, who knows? Uh, and we'll hopefully get them to shift and spread out enough that we can determine the sequence things are loaded in. So, um, this will give me basically a perfect view of everything the CPU ever does, especially if I can get this x-axis to be up to like, 
I don't know, a thousand cycles is pretty good. Um, that means I could potentially graph and figure out what the processor is doing under the hood for any specific operation up to like a thousand cycles or some reasonable uh, value here. And that means I could look into what microcode is doing. I could look at uh, like what's happening inside of an already RAND. I can observe what's happening through a memory axis. I could look at what Meltdown and Spectre are actually doing under the hood. Uh, because I would have perfect knowledge of all loads that are occurring on the system, regardless of if they happen during speculation or not. So you might be looking for some, like, evidence of, of how the ever-loving fuck that works. Um, is there one graph per different instruction? Nope, I'm not going to actually have an ability to do that. So it's just going to be an x-axis in cycles, and I'm just going to have to... Uh, I'm going to have to kind of draw on the instruction boundaries myself. I've got a couple other techniques. Uh, I wrote a blog on the research kernel that I use. Uh, actually, I think I already have a Firefox open, uh, and I already had this open. So this blog uh, goes into a technique that I used that allowed me to view uh, x-axis time and cycles, and then the y-axis microarchitectural events. And this allows me to see when certain things are happening on the processor, uh, for example, I could see how many UAPs got executed over time, how many retire slots were used, uh, instructions that were retired. Like here, I can see there's a large delay until a lot of instructions actually ended up getting retired. I can see load UAPs getting dispatched. And I think I have a couple of graphs in here um, that I used to show kind of what's happening. Um, Let's see, so this one is showing like all port traffic. So these ports, these port numbers come from this uh, and they basically tell you different execution units inside of the uh, processor. So different things can happen on different ports and that allows me to kind of determine uh, what's being done on the processor over time. And this sort of stuff has given me some tremendous visibility into what the processor is actually doing and it's fundamental to a lot of the research that I do. Um, yeah, like in this case, I do four stores to memory. And then in the graph, apparently I clicked off it. I just coincidentally clicked right off it. Uh, here we can see that there are four uh, things issued to port four. And if we look at port four, port four is the store data port. And thus we can conclude we're observing the four stores that happen uh, in this example test case. Um, and we can also see them happen one cycle after another, which is the maximum throughput of stores on Intel processors currently. Um, and that sort of stuff is, is really cool. I, I get to see what's actually happening uh, behind the scenes. But this only shows me the like what operations are occurring. It doesn't necessarily tell me what the operations are occurring on or what the data is in flight. So that is effectively the goal of today, is to instrument those load ports uh, on this side of the processor here. Um, I guess I had it open here. Uh, these two ports here, ports two and three, have load ports on them. And my goal is going to be to sniff all of the traffic that goes across these load ports. Um, and that's an exceptionally hard problem. Uh, but I've got some ideas and some theories and some plans, so let's kind of get to it. So I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make a hash table here. Actually, we're gonna use a B tree map, and I'm gonna say um, observed. Actually, I want to do this on this thread. So here we can leak about, let's say, five thousand times a second. Uh, so there aren't actual PMCs for that. I am using the performance counters to do that. Um, but they're not meant to work in, in this way, um, uh, wherever I put that, yeah. They're, they are not supposed to work like this. <laughs> You're not supposed to get cycle by cycle information from them. So we kind of we kind of did some weird tricks in there. I think I went into those tricks. I think I did. Maybe I didn't. There's a chance I didn't talk about how I actually did that. No, I did, I think. Performance counters, goal, idea, implementation. Yeah, okay, I did. Yeah, so effectively what I do is I have, uh, I use the interrupts on an overflow of performance counters, and on an interrupt to the counters, you can have the other counters get disabled kind of atomically, not necessarily, but close enough. 
Uh, and I actually use that to stop multiple counters at the same time, and then I repeat something in a loop. So I run, I run code in a loop over and over again while I'm gathering this information. Um, and I basically have to, for every single point you see on the uh, graph like this, I actually ran the input through. So in fact, I probably ran the input through like 20 times for every point on here, and it gets it gets pretty expensive. Um, but for something that's like 500 cycles and I'm logging maybe eight different PMCs, uh, it's it probably only takes like five seconds. So it's not that slow. Okay. So I'm gonna make a quick little database here. We're gonna make a let mute uh, f uh, value freaks. And uh, we'll make a B tree map here. And this will be a uh, database storing um, values that were leaked and the frequencies they were leaked. Uh, B tree map U64, U64. And then here on a su successful leak, we'll do value freaks dot entry of uh, leaked dot or insert zero. And then we'll deref that plus equals one. And then down here, we'll go through let four val freak in value freaks dot iter print val uh, Lou 018x and then a frequency here we'll just do like a seven val freak and then we'll tab this in one okay so this will hopefully give us the yep we just got to bring that in from collections uh use uh alec collections b tree map Okay. And we need to get rid of the prints. We'll just comment it out. And now we should see, this will now be trying to leak those values and we'll get to see frequencies of the values that are actually getting leaked. Um, and in this case, we're actually only leaking the value that we want to, which is fantastic. So now what we can do is I'm going to do a similar thing. I'm going to write uh, a value at 8. And then here I'm just going to do leet, 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 leet. And then in this loop, we're going to do a healthy mix of reading this value and this value in memory. So we're just going to loop hammering those two. And we're going to hopefully see that we're seeing kind of both of those values uh, at a 50-50 distribution. Okay, and uh, it's not actually 50-50. It's actually like 10, 10 to 1 for the 7.7 E1. Um, and I'm not quite sure why there. The leak rate is still about the same, which is expected. Um, but it's still working, so I'm, I'm not too upset with this. This is still great. Um, so I'm able to see that there are two different values there. And you might be wondering, what what kind of cool stuff can you do with this? So I have this memory, this virtual address here, 70D feed. It's just a random address I picked, quote unquote random. I'm gonna map, uh, I'm gonna map memory there as dirty access, writable and present, uh, 4K mapping. And then I'm gonna decode those mappings so I can actually get access to the um, different page table info in them. And then I'm gonna write in to that memory uh, to batter. I'm going to write in our magical 77E1 value that you guys decided on. Uh, and then I'll need to go down here, and then we'll read from vadder instead. Vadder. Okay. Okay, so in this case, um, let's see. Nice. So, okay, still works exactly as expected. Performance is still the same as expected. Um, our leak rate's actually really high. I like that. Okay, looks great. I just jumped in. What are you working on? We're trying to build a graph that uh, effectively will tell us all of the values that go through the load port on an Intel processor. So everything that passes through here. Uh, we're effectively making like a Wireshark, but for an internal processor bus, uh, all in software in a way that we're really not supposed to. Um, so we're working, basically everything we're doing is undefined behavior right now.
So it's going to be about predicting and learning how that behavior actually works and then trying to coerce it to behave uh, in a similar way every time such that we can get meaningful data out of it. But effectively, we want to get visibility into all loads that are happening on the processor. Um, over time, we want to actually assign them a, a cycle count. Okay. So in this case, we see that this, uh, this value, the 770E142C whatever, is being um, uh, leaked every time. This is the only value we're leaking. So I'm actually going to slightly change this. And I'm going to mark... Um, I have these different levels of the translations. What I'm going to do is we're going to do a, um, a CPU invul pig. We'll invalidate the mappings for this. Uh, I forget what argument that takes. It might take a U size. It does. Okay. So we're going to perform an invalidation of that page. Every case here. We're going to see how that looks. Okay, so we see a little bit more traffic going on here. Uh, now we see some other stuff happening on the processor that we have no idea what it is. Um, obviously, invilpig itself doesn't actually introduce a load, so these are done by the processor. So we're ob we're observing uh, we're observing like memory accesses here that are done on the processor itself. Um, and none of those really make any sense. I don't actually know what those values would be. Um, it does look like there's kind of a pattern here. They look kind of similar. These look like slightly uh, bit flips. We're still getting... Um, here we see some bit flips on our own thing. Actually, we see we see the bot. that's the bottom part of what we're trying to leak in two variants. Okay. Um... And that's fine. There's going to be noise on on our leaks. That's just kind of an un unfortunate circumstance. What we're probably actually seeing here is uh, the processor might be fetching something from that page. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> what am I watching? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> that's what we're trying to figure out. So we now have these values flying around the processor here. Uh, which is pretty neat. Um, it looks like they're just kind of truncated, maybe 32-bit zero extended versions of the value that we're trying to leak uh, with a couple bit flips on, a, on certain fields. Luckily, um, we're going to have a lot of noise here. Um, we're going to have a lot of... We're going to have a lot of bit flips because the leak isn't perfect and it's going to be impossible to get it perfect. Uh, it's very, very difficult to to get this to to be perfect so instead what we're going to look at is the frequencies of these things and that will allow us to kind of say that these two uh with the low counts the four and two basically like a tiny percentage of frequencies uh these are probably er erroneous so we're going to do some like post-processing here on those um just got here and i'm very confused saw wireshark in the title and assume network something I have no idea what a load port is are you just capturing CPU activity or something? Yeah, that's effectively what we're doing. So uh, inside your processor, this is effectively what your processor looks like, or, or more specifically, your, your Skylake processor. Um, typically in silicon, they get rid of a lot of the words and the labels, but uh, this is close enough. <laughs> so effectively, uh, if here, we can, we can talk through how your processor effectively works at a very, 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 very high level. So you've got some code running on your processor, and we can take a look at uh, uh, where is uh, oh obj dump. We'll just do it on itself. Okay, so we can do this on user bin object dump, um, and this is going to go and disassemble all of object dump, and we're going to use uh, m intel because. Uh, at t syntax is just wrong. Um, okay. So this is effectively the, like, code that actually gets executed on your processor. So if we're looking through this, we see that, like, things are getting moved between registers. Something's getting XORed, which is a bitwise operation. It's calling printf, which is a function call. It's jumping somewhere. If it doesn't, uh, I guess that jump is probably just directly after this. 1B89, 1B89... 
Yeah, uh, let's jump into something way up here. Doesn't really matter. But this is effectively what your processor is actually working on. Um, it's relatively, at least on x86, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I, I, I guess I, I should reword that. Um, x86 is an incredibly complicated architecture, but due to the fact that the architecture is complicated, the assembly is a little bit easier to read than I would say uh, like ARM assembly is. Um, it's harder to learn, but it's easier to read because it's higher level, because it's more complex, whatever. Anyways, so those instructions you've got uh, down here in the memory subsystem is, is where we're going to start. So in here, we have a lot of stuff. We've got like the L2 cache, you got the L1 cache, we got L3 cache, and then memory beyond L3 cache way out here on this bus. Uh, this diagram is only looking at what actually exists on the core of, a, of an Intel processor. The L3 cache is actually shared between all cores on a single physical processor um, or like processor on the die because you could have two processors in, in one uh, chip. Um, and then the L1 and L2 is duplicated for every, every core, typically. Some weird exceptions for hyper-threading stuff. So effectively, you're going to go and chug along. You're going to want to execute this. You want to execute this move RBP racks. And uh, what's going to happen is the processor is going to know it wants to execute this instruction. And to execute this instruction, it's going to have to get this memory. It has to get these three bytes that compose this instruction, this these are the bytes of this instruction, and it's going to have to request from memory that I would like to read address 1B4A3. Obviously, everything's more complex than this, but uh, it's effectively going to say, I want to read the memory here. And memory is really slow. Memory is exceptionally slow. And due to the fact that memory is so slow, uh, the processor has to introduce a lot of these caches on the processor. So first, for some perspective, uh, a memory load on x86 on a new local node is probably in the ballpark of 80 to 180 cycles. And I typically say 150 cycles on average, um, but that's kind of an old number now, so I should stop saying that, but whatever. 150 cycles for a, for a local memory access, and about 250 cycles for a remote memory access. And that's only going to happen if you have multiple processors, not multiple cores, but multiple physical processors. Because when you want to read another processor's memory, you have to request it through that processor, which adds latency. Um, so what is 150 cycles? Um, 150 cycles is kind of an eternity. And the reason for that is um, when you're running uh, when you're running just traditional like mathematical operations, the processor can typically do like four of those per cycle. So like uh, like an add instruction. I don't have one here or actually I think I saw one somewhere. Like an add instruction, for example, from register to register, the processor can do four of those per cycle. So that means in the time it takes for a memory access, which we are saying is 150 cycles, we could do 600 adds. We could do 600 uh, 64 bit adds. So that should give you some perspective of how incredibly slow memory is. Um, and this is like a pretty average number. Worst case number is actually much worse than this. So. To alleviate that, when the processor goes to fetch this instruction, it pulls it in from memory. It's going to then store that in this L2 cache, which is larger, but more exp or it's going to store it in an L3 cache. We're going to ignore that. Uh, L3 cache is like 40 cycles, or used to be, maybe 35 now. Uh, L2 cache is typically like 10 to 15 cycles. Um, and then that will end up in the L1 cache, which is about four cycles. And the L1 cache is just that. It's... Uh, it, it's literally 37, 40 times faster than, uh, than a memory access, and thus the processor wants to cache as much as it can. So it's going to grab that memory, and it's going to put it in these caches. And that means if that memory is accessed again, it's going to see that it's in this cache. So when a request for memory will go out, it'll go to the L1 cache. The L1 cache will say, I have that. Here it is. Or it will say, I don't have it. And then that will get issued to the L2 cache and so on and so forth to the L3 and, and finally to physical memory. Um, but whatever. 
Uh, let's say it's an L1 cache. So at that point, the processor is kind of ready to execute this instruction. It actually overread uh, the amount of memory that it needed. So the uh, cache lines are 64 bytes. So whenever you read like one byte in memory, it's technically going to read 64 bytes into a cache line. Um, now, once it's in the cache line, it'll only be reading the one byte out of that line. It's more complicated than that. It's probably 16 bytes, um, but whatever. So that L1 instruction cache, that's gonna get fed to this instruction fetch and, and pre-decode. This is effectively going to actually consume that instruction from the, uh, the L1 cache, and that's also what issued the request for the instruction to memory. Um, this pre-decode is just going to, uh, I actually don't remember, I think this is just length decoding it. So on x86, you can see over here on the right that the instructions uh, vary in length. So like this instruction is two bytes, this is three, this one is five, so on and so forth. So I think in pre-decode, it finds the um, instruction boundaries. It basically chops it up into pieces. Um, and so we've got, we've got like these two bytes. It, it'll end up reading like 16 bytes. So let's say that's 16 bytes, it's pretty close. Um, and then this pre-decode phase is going to split this up and cut them into the pieces that, that compose these instructions. Um, that's going to go into the second stage, which is the instruction queue. This is going to hold the instructions that the processor wants to execute. Obviously, this is kind of like another cache. And further, um, and I think this this uh, 50 comma 20 times 25 entries is denoting what happens on uh, single threaded and with hyper threading. So I think this is signifying that with hyper threading, this instruction queue gets halved and it gets uh, equally partitioned between them. So then there's something called macro fusion. Macro fusion uh, is actually pretty undefined. We don't know exactly what gets fused, but we know that certain things like calls and jumps get fused or um, compares and jumps. So if I were to find an example of a conditional, here we go. So here we have like a compare EAX with a seven. And then if it's below or equal to seven, so if it's unsigned less than or equal to seven, it's gonna jump here. And in this macro fusion stage, the processor is actually gonna merge this into one complex operation that's gonna basically be like a compare branch. Um, and that means that this no longer takes two slots throughout the rest of this uh, pipeline. It's only gonna take one slot. So it kind of saves some of these uh, limited resources. Okay, um, let me catch up on chat. Uh, is this the amount of low-level knowledge, uh, something that took a long time to learn, uh, or are you just really smart with photographic memory and absorbed it in a weekend? Nope, uh, this is just a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of time. Can you control what gets stored in the different caches, or is it entirely up to the processor? Um, there's technically not supposed to be a direct way uh, to do that. However, that's not entirely true. So um, you can mark certain memory as uncacheable in the page tables. There's also something called MTRRs, uh, which are like memory type reserve ranges or something like that, where you can designate certain regions of memory to not be cached or to be cached, vice versa. Um, so you, you have a little bit of control. Actually, you have pretty fine grain control over whether things get put into a cache at all or not but you don't have a huge amount of control into what level of the cache they get stored into. Um, technically at a, there are a couple instructions called prefetch instructions. And these prefetch instructions allow you to, um, uh, let me actually see if I can find, these technically allow you to kind of request the, the level of cache that you wanna bring into, but all of this is, is hints. And getting these to actually behave exactly as you want them to is a relatively hard problem. Um, but yeah, so th there's these prefetch instructions. There's move NTA. Uh, move NTA is a non-temporal, and that one's going to actually allow you to um, read memory uh, as like write combining, which will effectively cause it, I think, to... It, it'll cause the writes that are next to each other to get combined in an internal buffer before they're written, but they're still going to be non-cached. Um, 
But so you have a little bit of control over it, but not a huge amount. Anyways, so once these like macro ops have been made, which is basically just saving some space on the on the you know different decoders or different uh, caches in this processor, then this is actually going to get decoded, and this is going to basically the determine the UOPs that need to get executed. So, so far we've been working with instructions or macro ops. Technically, instructions and macro ops are different, but we're gonna just say they are the same. Um, so, x86 has not changed really at all since uh, 1970s, 1980s. And a lot of that is for backwards compatibility. And you might be wondering, why is x86 so prominent throughout computing? Why is ARM not being used on the desktop? And fundamentally, it is it is backwards compatibility. It's it's pretty hard for there to be any evidence of of anything else. X eighty six also performs a little faster than ARM right now. Still, uh, that's changing. Um, effectively, X eighty six kind of has this like contract, uh, not a real contract, but this obligation to maintain the architecture to have backwards compatibility with previous applications. And that means that you can run an application from uh, 1985 on your modern processor that came out a week ago. And you might be saying like, no, it doesn't work. My game doesn't work on modern Windows. That's a software issue. That is not an architectural issue. I can easily run any arbitrary x86 code on my modern processor that would have run in 1985. Now, maybe the environment and the software and the operating systems no longer support those modes. However, the processor does. Um, and that's a pretty incredible feat. But if you commit to using the same architecture forever, you, you lose a lot of your control from changing things and, and making the architecture into what you actually want it to be. Um, so what we do, uh, or what what architectures do is they actually use a microarchitecture. And what that means is that under the hood, your x86 processor doesn't actually execute x86 instructions. It converts the x86 instructions into instructions that can express any x86 instruction. Um, and to do that, we have these UOPs, these micro ops or microarchitectural operations. And this is what the processor actually will execute. So once it's been decoded and converted from this x86 monstrosity to these fixed width micro ops that can change every week, like Intel can just change these if they want, change the behavior of the, of the internals of the processor as long as this like conversion between x86 and that still works. So then those are going to get into an allocation queue. That's basically going to hold the instructions that we quote unquote want to execute. Uh, those will get jammed into uh, kind of this renaming, allocating retirement stuff. This is going to basically schedule and figure out where uh, instructions should run. So the processor will do things out of order. Let's uh, let's see if we can find a good example. Um, let's see. I, I want like a good compare, maybe a dependent. Uh, arithmetic. Here we go. Uh, it's not a great example. Let me let me uh, let me less that. See if I can find a, a better function here. Um, that's not great because that's a zeroing idiom. Um, here we go. Here's like a good example. So this is going to check whether Rax is zero. It's going to see if the value inside of RAX is zero. It's then going to store that value into R13, and then it's going to conditionally move into R14 that value uh, from Rax if it's non-zero. So basically, if this is non-zero, then it's going to write that into R14. Now, there's a dependency chain here, and we're going to ignore this call. Uh, there's a dependency chain here that says that this operation cannot complete until this comparison has been performed. Because obviously this is blocking, it's waiting for the result of this comparison. So what the processor is actually going to do is it's going to figure out that uh, it's going to perform this instruction, it's going to perform this instruction, it's then going to be waiting on this one to retire, not necessarily retire, but have the results of it available for internal use in the processor, much different from retirement. Um, but what it, when it's 
quote unquote blocking for this. It'll be reserved. It will actually be in this allocation queue or maybe in this reorder buffer. But it will find that this XOR R12D R12D actually doesn't depend at all on R14. And thus this instruction can actually execute while this one's still pending. And that is uh, basically the fundamentals of out-of-order execution. It's determining the dependency chains inside of the processor and then only performing operations uh, when they need to be performed. And that allows some look ahead where things will get executed when they're not ready yet, um, even though because it's known, quote unquote, in the processor, it's known that uh, it doesn't depend on this. And for example, this uh, memory fetch followed by a test, which is an and, uh, this could also be occurring while this move is blocking. Um, so there's some like pretty weird things that, that happen there. Okay, anyways. Uh, that's going to go to this reservation uh, station scheduler. This is going to like know all the things that can be executed. In fact, it's very similar to these other queues for the level of depth we're going to go into. Um, and once it gets to this reservation station, it's going to queue things for these ports. It's going to say, hey, I need to execute a load. So I need to execute something on these ports. And I also want to execute, let's say, an add. And the add can be run on one of these uh, three different or four different ports, 0, 1, 5, and 6. And this scheduler is basically going to determine which ports are free, um, and it's going to give that instruction there. So if port 0 had someone using it, and port 1 did, and port 6 did, it's up to the scheduler to know that port 5 is currently not in use, and that it can dispatch the add there for it to be handled. Um, what is the time there? It's uh, it's only 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. here. Okay. And then that's going to actually execute the instructions. They're going to get uh, put back into, like, committing into the registers, which there are a lot more registers than the 16 that you're used to in x86. Um, and that's fine and dandy. Then on the memory side of things, we talked about going up for the instruction fetch, but it's a little bit more complicated on the data side. So whenever you want to load data, it has to. It has to go through a load buffer. And a load buffer is, is basically the, the highest performance cache on the processor in terms of like memory cache. And that's actually pumped uh, with two pipes from the L1 cache. And the reason that's piped twice is that allows two loads to occur per cycle on x86. Um, you can only perform one store per cycle. So the L1 data cache can fill two lines per cycle to the load buffers, and the load buffers are where the load data is block uh, for their um, information. And effectively, what that allows you to do is you can have 72 loads queued up for execution, and they're sitting in these load buffers. So the load buffer, no idea what they actually look like, but it's effectively like it's probably an address sitting there, maybe a physical, maybe a virtual address sitting in there, um, and it's saying, I want to fill this. And it's just sitting there waiting for it. And the L1 cache, I don't know who is responsible for it, but eventually when the L1 cache gets the data that it's ready with, uh, the load buffer will be filled in and that will cause the load to succeed. And then that load buffer will get evicted to make room for, for uh, subsequent use. Um, and I might have a graph of that. Um, I hope I do. I actually went through and I researched a lot of this stuff to determine uh, if it actually held up. Um, CPU graphing, not quite. Mm, I'm not quite sure. But effectively, I, I went through and I, I tried, in fact, doing that. I tried having 72 loads queued up, or an infinite amount of loads queued up, and I wanted to see when the load stopped getting executed, and it was indeed at 72. It was actually at like 71, but there's probably some noise in, in a load that I was performing. Um, and that allowed me to validate kind of all these numbers throughout this different uh, stage of the memory subsystem. Uh, further in here, we have the, um, the store buffers are, are basically the same thing. They're the same as the load buffers. They're sitting between the actual store operation and the uh, L1 cache, and they're holding pending operations. Um, 
Then we have the data TLB here. The TLB is effectively what handles the translation from virtual address to physical address. So pretty much forever processors now have had virtual memory, which allows you to kind of create an like arbitrary memory shape using uh, a, a contiguous block of physical memory. Um, and these TLBs hold those uh, translations because uh, they're pretty expensive. Um, and then these line fill buffers are actually, they're sitting here between the L2 and the L1. And these are holding um, cache lines as they're flying in from the L2 uh, to basically hold uh, pending fill requests. So this is where when the L1 cache misses, it's going to allocate a line fill buffer entry, and it's going to sit there until it's fulfilled from L2 cache, which is from memory. Very similar to like a load buffer, except this is more for like the, this is more for the execution side of things. Of it has more entries, it's faster, um, and this is more for the memory access. Even though it goes to L2 cache. Uh, typically, by the time you're allocating LFBs, you're you're probably missing caches pretty hard. So this is a little more expensive, um, and it serves a, a slightly different purpose. But this just kind of holds active requests effectively, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, why do they not pump it through here? Well, that's because uh, this can handle two. Uh, two 64-byte reads per cycle, and this one can only handle one. So this is just a, a completely different bus, a completely different stage of, of the processor, um, and that's why that's there. Okay, cool. So that's effectively how your processor works at a very high level. Any, any questions about that? And effectively, what we're trying to do in this stream is we're trying to get perfect knowledge of all loads that fly across the load ports. Um, and that's a really hard problem. Uh, you're not supposed to see the data that goes to load ports because, I mean, obviously if you do a read, you get the result of that, but the processor also runs code on the processor itself um, that you don't necessarily uh, have control over. And we are going to show that. We'll, we'll show some evidence for that. So I just set this up to read from this memory. So let's see what we did. So I took, I took an address. I mapped one page at that address. Um, what did I pick as the backing for that? OK. I think that one's just going to cause a, a new free page to get allocated. That's going to get put in there. I'm going to decode each level of the page table manually here uh, just because I need to get all the pointers to those different stages. Um, and then I'm going to print out that page table info. Actually, that's a really interesting 6.3 there. 6.3 uh, to me looks like a page table entry. Um, but we're going to take a look. OK. So a lot of what we have to do here is going to be um, uh, okay, are you pinning your binary to a certain CPU to uh, measure this stuff? Yes, yes. Everything here is pinned to a, a very specific thread. Uh, there's no uh, interrupts or task switching. No preemption, no task switching. Okay. So we have a value here, 2C988027. And we only actually saw that once. Uh... And here we go. Here are the page table entries. I'm just going to paste them over here. Those are the page table entries for the memory we're accessing. And here we can see that we were able to leak a value that was 2C9880271. And that might look like it's a bit error. It might look like it's an erroneous uh, bit because we have a, a 27 here instead of here where it's just an 07. But that 2.7 is actually the accessed bit. We're actually observing the processor access that page table entry after the access bit is set. So what's really cool here is here's our example code. We're calling invalidate page, which is a single instruction that's just going to invalidate the TLBs for that entry. And then we're just going to read that memory. That's all we're doing here. And we're able to observe a zero. Uh, this is pretty common. Uh, zero is typically like the processor has nothing to, to give you. Uh, so while it's possible that it's actually reading zero, it's also very, very likely uh, that this is just uh, just a failure and we can discard these. 
We've got a 6-3 here. Uh, and a 6-3 to me looks like a, a page table entry for a giant page, which is indeed what I actually use in my... Uh, this could be the code itself. I think this would exist in this location in memory. Not 100% sure. Uh, we've got the 2-9-B-A-F-F-E. This is the bottom 32-bit, so a 32-bit zero extended value. Um, this one we only saw once, but this is indeed identical to the page table uh, entry um, for the final level paging of that uh, of that access we're performing. And I would say that is pretty cool. And then down here we have, this one looks like a, a bit flip on this. Seems like we're not seeing it too much, so I think we can discard that as potentially an error. And then here we can see the actual, the load, uh, the, the value itself. Okay. So that's all the loads dispatched in whatever time frame that is. Uh, this is not retired. It's all it's all loads at at all um, on this core, regardless of if they're retired or if they're speculative or if they succeeded or if they failed or if they faulted. And I can prove that to you by doing this. Um, here we'll do. Uh, we're already in unsafe. We'll make some uh, inline assembly here. We'll mark it as Intel syntax and volatile. And then we'll mark some clobbers on memory and flags. And in here, I'm going to perform a uh, X begin to F, X end, a two. Uh, here we'll have an int three. And this is going to be, if you're not familiar with X begin and X end, they're from the TSX instruction sets, uh, transactional synchronous uh, execution. Think of it like a try catch. So we're gonna try here. This is gonna be our like, uh, except here, or this, yeah. This is gonna be like, except, that's gonna be the try block effectively. This is going to be the like, finally the fall through, and then this is gonna be the accept, effectively. So this is gonna say, uh, execute the code between X begin and X end. Uh, if it faults, or technically it's not meant for faults, it's meant for doing atomic operations. Um, if it fails, or the, the atomicity is not guaranteed, then we're gonna jump to 2F, and we're gonna unwind everything that was done. So it's kinda like a hardware try catch. So here we can do a move, racks, of, uh, um, I don't actually even know a good address. Let me do a, um, I might be able to do, I don't think an int3 will actually pass through here. RBX. So this is a non-canonical access. So that's going to cause a fault. And then we're going to load from here from our, our magic address. So we're going to pass this into RCX. We're gonna pass in our virtual address. So then I'm gonna deref uh, RCX. Right, so this access never occurs because this faults, um, but this access does occur because of the out of order execution like I mentioned before. So we're gonna take a look at what we see here. We're gonna see a lot more noise. Uh, and there we go, there we see our value. So, we see the value that we're loading here in this move racks RCX, even though it's shadowed, uh, it's behind of a fault that occurred, and it's inside of this try catch that's gonna unwind everything that occurred. Um, so this allows us to see every load that's happening on the processor, regardless of speculation, if it's dispatched by the processor, if it's dispatched by our own code, if it's a microcode assist, uh, it doesn't matter. We can, we can see everything we want. Uh, just to be clear, this program is a kernel that runs on a target machine with a skylake. Yes, this I think is a cabby lake, maybe. Um, I don't remember exactly what processor this is, but it's based on the skylake microarchitecture, yeah. Okay. Sweet, sweet, sweet. So, now we've demonstrated that we can uh, survive through a fault, which is awesome. So we had that really interesting case where we actually saw the, um, so we're showing, we showed there that we were actually viewing speculative loads. Um, and now what I want to demonstrate is that I can view loads that don't actually happen uh, by us. They're not issued by us. So I'm going to do a CPU 
or a core pointer write volatile to virtual address as uh, actually I want to go to um, ptep. This is the page table entry pointer. This points to the entry in the page table, this final level mapping. And I'm going to write into that, uh, I guess I don't actually know what the value is going to be on there. And I don't want to read it. Um, let orage PTE is equal to core pointer read volatile ptep unsafe. And then here we'll write the original PTE, and I think we mark this as access. We're going to get rid of that. Okay, so what this is going to do is it's going to cause us to... Um, we're going to have the page table entry by default not be accessed. And let's see... Yeah, so we're going to write that out, and that's going to cause it to clear that access bit and then invalidate the mapping and then read that, which will cause the translation to occur. And hopefully we see more page table accesses occur now. We're not. Okay. That's fine. Paul the Pirate, thank you for subscribing. Hell yeah. Hope you're enjoying the content. Okay, so let's take a look here at what we're doing wrong. Um, invul pig on that. Read volatile. Maybe we need a, an M fence. Let me print this original PTE. The original PTE. Oh, that's going to... Oh, yep, that's wrong because we do a write there, and that's going to cause the access bit to get set. Nice. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll grab this and I'll say let orig PTE is equal to orig PTE and the inverse of dirty and accessed. So we're basically going to mask off the dirty and accessed bits from that. Mismatch types, eye size. Um, yeah, we'll just do this. This is fine here. Okay. And there we go. Now we see, uh, I guess we're seeing all three levels of the page table access, actually. So we have 2C988, 2C987, 2C986 are the three levels in the page table. And then we have a PTE of 6.3. Uh, we see the... Oh, this is the final level, this three. And then we see these three levels. So I actually want to change that. Oh, I guess here, why I perform this mapping, I don't give it an address. I'm going to give this... Uh, Hopefully that memory is free. We're just going to hard code that address, that physical address. Okay, so here we can see the processor accessing the page table entry for, um, for this entry. So this is the, the final entry. That's the, if we look, that's the PTE here is this 6.3. We see it reading an 03, and that's because we're masking off the 6, and the 6 composes of two bits, which are the dirty bit and the access bit, which track whether or not that memory has ever been read or written to. Um, and we're clearing those bits every time, and that's why we're seeing the processor actually fetch the uh, 03 value. Okay, so further, what I want to do is I want to do this kind of for all the levels. Uh, so this will change to instead of ptep, this is going to be the pdep, pde, 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 pdep, and then this will be uh, pdp, pdp, tep. Uh, oops. Okay, we got the pdep, pde, pde, good. 
and then PD PDP tap PDP tap PDP we'll call that yeah PDPTE and then this will be the PML for EP Okay, that should be good. And these higher levels actually don't have dirty bits. They only have access to bits. So we're gonna get rid of the dirty bit clearing. We'll only clear the access bits. And then this will cause us to basically uh, disable all of the um, PML4EP. This will disable all the access and dirty bits. PDP tep and PDEP, PDE, DPTE and all for e Okay. Okay. Let's see what we got. A lot of these leaks are kind of failing. Okay, let's take a look at what we have. We've got a lot of leaks that failed. Um, hmm. Here we can see some accesses of the three. Here's the 23. Here we see all the different levels of the, the page table. Uh, we've got a C and E here. Um, I guess there's one we're missing. What do we have for all these? Actually, maybe I need an M fence here. We'll do an M fence before and after the invil pig. That's looking a lot better. Oh, that's so much better. Okay. So that means those reads weren't actually retired by the time the that completed. So I'm gonna let this run for a minute. Actually, I need to. Uh, I'm gonna turn down the frequency of the prints. We're gonna drop that to, uh, I think we just have to put an F here. 16 times slower. We'll slow down this prints a little bit. We'll clear this so we don't have history. And we'll just, I'm gonna run this and I'll be right back. Okay, this is looking fantastic. So we know the final level, the page table entry, uh, is right here. We've actually observed that a lot. Uh, here we've seen different levels of the page table. I don't know what these 5A, 5A patterns are. Um, I don't think that's anything in our stuff. 2C97F, E-D. 2C97F, FED. So here we see this is the um, top level page. This is the mid level page. This is the, the page directory entry. And then this is the, the final translation of the page uh, table entry. We see some variants where we see them. We typically see them with the accessed and dirty bits clear, but we also sometimes observe them without those bits set. Um, I don't quite understand how that works, uh, but that might be a race in the processor. 
We also see these 5A, 5A values, which I have no idea what they are. Um, similarly, we see these falling off at, at, at pretty similar rates. We're seeing them without the access, which is what I would expect in most cases. Uh, but we sometimes see them with access, like down in these versions. And that might be due to reordering or speculation or um, maybe like branch misprediction on the loop. Uh, it's kind of really strange. So is there a way to sort out the timing f uh, of those PMC interrupts to avoid noise from leaking loads that happened before? Um, kind of, but not in the not in the best way. Yeah, it, it's all completely undefined. And in fact, there are a lot of cases where it's actually, it actually varies in silicon. Like just from run to run, shit varies based on like edges of timers coming through. Uh, that subsystem is not really meant to be deterministic at all. And they mention that a lot. I find this value very interesting. So, uh, we say 5a, 5a, 5a a lot. And what is that? Is that a magic for divides? Uh, oops. 5a, 5a magic. Um, divide. No. Not sure. Um, that's kind of interesting. I, I have no idea where that value is possibly coming through. It's cl it's clearly this 5a, 5a value. We're seeing a 5a here in the low byte sometimes. Uh, E4, that's from this leak. 237, those are just the bottom bytes from what we're seeing in, in these different cases. Um, but that's really cool. So... What's interesting here is the value that we're reading is actually less common than the uh, page table entry. But what's neat is that we are not reading any of these values. The only value that we're actually reading is this one. But we're able to see the processor internally updating page table entries. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, and that's why I like this technique so much. And, and it's so interesting because we're able to see loads that are dispatched uh, by the processor itself. So if we want to get really wild, um, I'm going to comment out everything here. So now we have, we have nothing happening on this processor anymore. Um, we're probably just going to see zero. Maybe we'll see some noise from the core itself. We might see two different values here. I'm not sure. I'm going to turn that printing frequency up. OK. OK, so we just see like some random thing. That's, yeah, that's probably just a pointer to some, some random thing in my kernel. In fact, uh, yeah, I know what that value is, actually. OK. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue an instruction. <laughs> I'm so used to unsafe blocks that I nest them. I'm going to issue a um, I'm going to do a already ran into racks. Uh, and we're going to clobber racks in this case. And I think CC as well. So already rand is really interesting because already rand doesn't touch memory, right? Right? Already rand doesn't touch memory. But it does. We see a lot of random values now coming through with like histogram one value. So already rand indeed inside the processor is going through the load ports. I don't know if it's something inside the processor that's issuing, uh, like, I don't know if already rand is implemented in microcode and the microcode implementation of already rand is actually grabbing, uh, reading something from memory. Um, I actually suspect, I'm gonna try, uh, we're gonna do a XOR EAX EAX already MSR. We're gonna read an MSR. So 
So we're going to read the, the zero with MSR. I think it's EAX. We might also need ECX here. So let's see what happens here. Um, that is printing that value. Let's print this. Uh, let's actually just... Um, I actually have code to do this, I think. Um, uh, CPU read MSR uh, zero. Comment this out. So we're just going to do a read MSR. Whoa. Oh, yeah, we're just printing a lot now. We'll print once. We'll print once and then we'll do it here. So we'll print the results of that, read MSR, and yeah, okay. That looks good. Unterminated block comments. Let's see what we got here. Yup. Okay, um, we see some, we see, this actually looks like a pointer, so I don't think we're getting anything there. Let me try a different MSR. CPU ID might be interesting as well. Yeah, it's still just a pointer, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Um, CPU ID. And then here we'll do uh, CPU ID, EAX, sometimes ECX, okay. Put a zero in there, we'll do a CPU ID. I know I can X for that, but this is easier to change. Okay. I meant to do a CPU ID, not an MSR actually in that first case. Uh, expected two parameters. Let's see what this does. Nope, nothing there. Okay, cool. Okay, awesome. No surprises, but RD Rand is still a surprise to me. RD Rand, in my opinion. And maybe it's because we're uh, saving and restoring those. So I'm going to get rid of my clobbers. In fact, I'm just going to do this. Uh, to jump to be. So now we're doing already ran in a loop, and we know that there's nothing in our code that's possibly uh, causing that to get flushed into memory. Yeah, and there we go. We still see the random values. So already Rand certainly is touching memory somehow. Now, there's a chance that internal to the processor that memory is not actually always memory. It could be possible that certain internal processor registers are banked as memory. I think that would kind of make sense to me where you would have... Um, it's been done in processors for ages, so it wouldn't be anything new if it's done in modern processors, but where you would have... Uh, like the top few bits that aren't used in a physical address could maybe mux some other special part of processor uh, address space. It would be very interesting to see. In fact, um, I could add a filter on my print here. IP th IPC through memory, yeah, totally, could totally be a thing. Um, if the if the frequency is greater than one, problem is we might just run out of memory here because we're gonna just have this massive database. Perf's gonna go through the floor. I'm just trying to see if there's a another value that has any frequency here. It looks like all the values were observed with frequency one. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, cool. 
data data so yeah there you there you go okay so I'm gonna go back to this and we're gonna read we're gonna read that memory in a loop forever that's wild yeah yup never bef never before seen CPU traffic you're watching it here live yeah but I bet no one has uh, no one has mentioned that or seen that before isn't that cool isn't that cool what you get when you're using crazy nutty CPU introspection stuff it's like we're making a debugger but for hardware <laughs> Okay, so we're going to pop into, um, okay, so we've got that value. Let's load up one other value here. <laughs> run it for a week, see if it's uniform. Oh, my God. I'd run out of memory. <laughs> uh, what am I going to do here? Uh... I'm going to byte swap that. I'm going to write that to uh, 1008, and this will put out 1000. Down here, I'm going to read from 1000. 1008. Now I've got some ideas for some tricks here. Uh, byte swap, swap bytes. All right, here we go. Okay, so those are actually evenly distributed. Beautiful. It's exactly what I want to see. Okay. Let me catch up on chat. Hello, I am a student in computer engineering, and I'm cur curious about what classes I should take to learn about these things you are doing. Uh, I'm planning to take embedded systems. Anyone have any recommendations? I'm actually not too familiar with the courses that are present. Computer engineering is definitely the way to go over computer science if you want to learn about this level of stuff. Um, this all, honestly, this is more like uh, like hardware stuff. Uh, more of like the double E track would cover this stuff than computer engineering. Now, it kind of depends on the school. I know like CMU has a pretty impressive uh, computer engineering course, and they cover a lot of the hardware-y kind of things. Um, embedded systems probably actually won't go into a lot of this stuff, and the reason for that is embedded is, is a lot simpler. Uh, embedded typically doesn't have paging. It typically doesn't have out-of-order execution. Typically doesn't have crazy levels of caching. Um, that being said, I think it'll get you a lot of the foundation that will get you in the right direction to understand how these things work. Um, so, I don't know. Hopefully that helps. Okay, so these look evenly distributed, which is exactly what I like to see. So now what I want to do is I need to perform a single leak, and I also need to, um... I need to perform this operation once and on like a latched thing. So I think I'm going to implement uh, a lock here. So unfortunately, the performance is going to go through the floor here because uh, atomic operations are really, really, really expensive and sharing memory is really slow. Uh, the like fastest propagation you get by writing to memory before another core sees that, pro uh, that write is typically like 60 to 70 cycles. Now, luckily, we're on the same hardware thread, so we might actually get some speed ups there. Um, but let's see what we can do. So I'm going to do a uh, while. We're going to make like a, a ticket lock effectively here. Um, and we'll just put this up here. Uh, let ticket acquire this is going to be equal to ox once 1200 as mute atomic u size and this will put here uh 
perfect. And um, down here we're gonna get a ticket. Uh, ticket dot uh, acquire. Fetch. Add. Oops. One ordering sequentially consistent. While ticket is not equal to ticket release. Um, dot load ordering sec. Okay, and we're just gonna loop. So we're gonna get a ticket, fetch add. So we'll we'll fetch a zero. Then we're gonna while the ticket is not equal to release. Then we're gonna do this, and this is gonna fire off. This should happen once right now. Both of those should be starting at zero. I actually probably should zero them out first. Uh, we gotta pull in those dependencies. Use. Uh, here we'll pull in use core. Uh, core. I think it might, is it in sync? It isn't here in standard, but I don't think it is in core. Nice. And this can be a constant. So we're gonna perform the cast. We're gonna deref it and convert it into a Rust reference. And then I'll do ticket acquire dot store zero ordering sequentially consistent. Hopefully no one else is using this memory because if we just pick some random physical addresses, I think we're fine. Okay, it's apparently unsafe to do that. Shocker. There we go. Uh, did we get it? Yeah, firing, perfect, sweet. So that now allows me to do, on the release side of things, every time I'm about to go do a leak, I can do fetch add one that will cause us to release it and then do one leak and then we're good I think in theory in practice okay that's interesting oh it's not necessarily we're, we're leaking the uh we're actually leaking the <laughs> we're, we're leaking the the value from the um ticket lock <laughs> that's pretty cool um i'm going to switch this to an atomic u8 to reduce the amount of unique values that we have coming out of these tickets Still fair and fine. Okay, hopefully we're still seeing the values we want leaked. Kind of. I think that's close to it, right? Uh, 2A23. Ooh. No idea where that's coming from. That's a problem. Oh, it's not. Okay. So we're going to release that. Uh, this we're going to sleep. So this is fine. This is going to run. That'll go through its first case first. Then this will come through. It will then release it once, perform a leak, show us the value that it leaked. Um, then we're going to print on this frequency. Uh, and then here, I'm going to filter. I'm going to say if the value, if the value is greater than a thousand. 
Actually, we'll say like 10,000. We're effectively looking for like a, a not low. We're, we're looking to dodge our ticket. Okay, firing. Nice. Beautiful. We're not seeing anything observed except for this. Uh, firing, we're going to get rid of that print because that's slowing us down. We're not seeing anything leaked there. Let's try this. It might depend on the value of that pointer. Nope, we're not seeing it at all. Perfect. Uh, okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a... Um, we're going to do a sleep. Uh, and we're going to hard code this. R volatile intel clobbers racks move racks 1000 to deck racks J and Z to B. And this is going to be the crux. We're going to try and introduce a delay more and more. And this is going to be our x-axis indicator here. Um, we're going to try and we're going to try and cause the other thread to perform a load on a uh, we're going to like cause it to do the load and then we're going to wait a certain amount of time and then we're going to leak and that will hopefully cause the the since we're releasing the ticket hopefully the time it takes for this to propagate to here and this load to occur will be constant and if that is a constant then that means that if we delay this by a certain amount we might get that histogram uh Let's see. Do do do. I mean, a diploma thesis on benchmarking different data structures, and I had uh, to learn a lot about caches and stuff. It could also be a way. Yeah, optimizations will get you a lot of this. Um, although some unis uh, allows you to take a course different from different unis than one, uh, or even one that's online. Yep, absolutely. I'll have to watch this stream once again. All right, see you around Disconnected. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you had fun. And just a heads up, I have a Discord. If you want, there's a Discord link. Um, just feel free to hop in there and ask questions and just do whatever. So whenever I'm doing streams, uh, I'll maybe try and post in there. And it's a good way to chat with me when I'm not streaming, which can be uh, just completely random times. Okay, so that's probably too much of a delay. So... What I'm going to actually do is I'm going to do an arty rand just because it's easy. It's expensive, but it's easy. I'm going to do an and with racks uh, with FFF. So we're going to loop for up to 4,096. So 0 to 4,095 iterations of the loop. That's going to be like an arbitrary delay. And what I want to see is if we get values. Please. Um, is there a deadlock? It's getting stuck. I don't understand how that would happen. <laughs> um. Oh, if it's zero. If it's zero. Add racks one. Okay, nice. Hey, you do anything with Frida? Nope, I've never really done anything with Frida. <laughs> Discord is Zenfi tech support? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're not seeing the values. Uh oh. Now, there's a chance that this shitty delay that I'm doing is like not. not maybe it's not long enough. We could try this. I would hope to expect, or I would expect, I would, I would hope to expect, I would hope that my expectations are set. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, we're not seeing those values pop out. Here, we're releasing that. Fetch had that. If the ticket's not equal to the release, uh-oh. 
there's a chance that we're going too soon. I'm going to do this for I, I, and 0 dot dot 1024. We're going to cause uh, those loads to happen a lot more on that thread. That's really surprising to me. What if I unbound this? This should work as before. Yeah. Okay, so let's loop to uh, 10,000. And then I also might need to make another ticket for the continuation. Because I transfer execution to here, I then delay, then I leak, then I need to, I probably need to send a signal back. I might need to make another lock for the other direction such that I can cause the other one to wait its time. Okay, so we're, I'm actually really surprised there that we're not seeing that. That's now a really big number. It's like kind of close. That's working. Um, so that is, this is going to acquire first, then it's going to wait for it to be equal. Um, can I delay while they're equal? I think I can down here. This is going to be, I'm going to add some prints. Print, uh, causing activity. Okay. Print done with activity. Uh, yeah, we need another lock, so we'll do that again. We'll make another here. Uh, this we're going to call, like, end ticket. Great. End ticket. End ticket. We'll go to 10 and 18. Then down here. Okay. If you've done things with Frida, it's got a C module now. You can now do a lot of clever low-level stuff dynamically, including fuzzing. I've never really used Frida. In fact, I might not. I might have never, might have never used it. Okay. So at the end here, I want to fetch add on end ticket release. So we're going to come in here, we're going to add one to this. We're going to wait until the other one, the other thread releases that, which is here. Then, uh, print, um, delaying for leak. Obviously with these prints, none of this will work. Um, leaking. Then here I need to do the same logic as this at the end, I think. Actually, I can do this one to the top. Print Don waiting for end. Yeah. End ticket acquire, end ticket release. So in here, this is going to go through. That's going to release that. Uh, I think we have one issue there. What's going on here? Here. Okay. Uh, causing activity. Done with activity. Uh, where's the done with activity? Here you go. Then we release that. Then that's going to come up here. That's going to... That's not going to succeed because I think that's going to pass the first time. I need to set this one equal to 1. Brilliant. Okay, so the order is... Ok. 
kind of like wasn't expecting that to work right away. I mean, I was because like I knew it was going to be right, but I kind of didn't. Okay, causing activity. Oh, at the very start. We start off with causing activity, which is what we want. We want this to start first. That's going to do stuff. Done with activity. Timing cache properties. Oh, that's, uh, that's this. Okay. Done with activity. Causing activity. The first, the first iteration might be broken. Um, causing activity, done waiting for end. Ah, oh, shit. Something's broken here. Ah, oh, why is this logic always so hard? Zero, zero, one, zero. Okay, we want this to go first. This, it's going to get, it's going to fetch at that. That's going to get zero. It's going to then wait for this to be... Not equal to zero, it will be fine. Causing activity, it will do all this stuff. It will be done with activity. Fetch add to the end ticket release. Done. Then up here, up here, we're going to see, we're going to get the end ticket acquire, which is one. While it's not equal to zero, loop, which is true, then when this goes to update that, that will break through. That'll cause us to go here. We'll go to ticket release, which will then cause us to let the leak spin up. Delaying for leak, leaking. I think it's actually correct. Causing activity, done with activity. Done waiting for end. Done with activity, delaying for leak. Leaking, causing activity. Uh, I do something wrong here. It's also possible that these like prints are gonna get jumbled up. Hmm. I could just have stages where I have one counter and then I reset the counter each case and then they just like this blocks until it's at this stage and this blocks until it's at this stage. That might be a little bit cleaner here. I don't really like what I've done here. Actually, end ticket release. Done waiting for end. Yeah, we'll just go to that. This will now be an atomic U size. Uh, atomic U size. Ticket. Just call it ticket or like state. State uh, const. State. Uh, whatever the first thing we want it to do. I don't know yet. State dot store. So the first thing we want it to do is um first thing we want it to do is probably I don't do I want to do the leak first? No, I have to, I have to get the, um, state activity. And we'll just put these in like a magic range. We'll just start this at like 10. Okay. Then here... We're gonna say while state dot load ordering sequentially consistent is not equal to um, state activity. While it's not in the activity state, we're just gonna block here. If it is, um, in fact, I can do a, I can do a, 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 a
parent swap. There we go. We're going to compare and swap uh, current and new. So we'll do state activity with state uh, leak. And it returns probably the original. Yeah, always the previous value. So we're going to wait until we're in state activity. If we are, then we're going to atomically swap in state leak. Okay. This is much better. I, I like this a lot more. Up here, we're going to be state... Here, we're waiting for state leak. We're going to put this in state leaking. Ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. So it starts off in activity. That will cause this to break which will put it into leak state, which will then cause the leak thread to start running. Then um, this is gonna wait again to be back in activity. In the activity state, this one's going to go into leaking. Uh, that one's still gonna be blocking until it's back to activity and then down at the end here. Once everything is complete, we're going to put it back to, uh, to state activity. It should be in leaking because it hasn't changed on this thread. This only go uh, ticket release. Uh, this is going to be delaying for leak. This makes more sense. Uh, down here we need a print. Okay. Delaying for leak. Uh, causing activity, leaking, is that right? No, I want delaying for leak first. What? What? Leak to leaking. I'm confused. Causing activity. Delaying for leak. How are we seeing that print again? I want to see causing activity, delaying for leak, leaking. While it's not equal to leak, while it's not equal to leaking, And this is while is not equal to activity. How's it getting set to activity? Unless it's printing issues. But that's unlikely. I feel like I'm doing this right. Um... I'm really confused. Causing activity, delaying for leak, causing activity. So causing activity is just happening there. Is this delay way too long? It's already ran too expensive. I'll use II in here then. We'll pass in the racks.
Ja. Uh, failing activity, delaying for leak. Okay, and I'll put another print here. What am I doing wrong? Something stupid. I gotta put this clobber in for RBX. Before I forgetty. for leak. I feel like it's a printing bug. I'll let it sleep for a bit just to see. Uh, resetting. Delaying for leak. What the fuck? What? What? I'm just going to assume it's prints and they're just not sane. Activity, go to the leak state. Every set of values. Let me trim this down. Okay, now we're not looping. We're just reading them once. If we see values here, I'm really happy. Even if it's rare. Okay. Put this for loop back in. 10,000 iterations. This means that the... Oh, I'm really confused there. There we see him. Finally see him at 100,000. I don't think the delay is that long. I think that's because it's spilling over into the start of the next one, maybe? If I got rid of this, it just shouldn't work. I just want to make sure that it's like getting to that point and everything's blocking on each other. Good. Uh, we're going to put this into leaked. Then down here, we're going to wait for it to be in leaked. And that puts it back into activity state. Okay, so it starts an activity that'll cause this to complete, put it into leak state. This is going to run while that's in that state. It's gonna wait for it to be in, or into leak state. That'll wait for it to be in leak, leak, leaked state. This is going to wait for leak. Once it's in leak, it's going to delay a bit and it's gonna perform the leak. Then it's going to print some stats and then it's going to say it's done leaking at the end. That will cause this, that'll put it to leaked. That'll cause this to break, put in an activity state. Okay.
There we see him. But we didn't see him at a thousand? Oh, that's how long it takes for the leak to set up. Oh my god, I think it's working. Okay, cool. Oh, that's really cool. Okay. Um. Wow. Wow. I actually want to put the delay on this side. I think. Actually... I need to add a fixed delay here. I need to like binary search for this. This is gonna be actually kind of hard. Um, I need to have a delay on this side because the leak has a lot of spin up time, a lot of prep time. Um, I could maybe do that spin up time first. That might make more sense. That's kind of difficult. Um, right before I go do the leak, I could potentially then swap this into leaking activity. So this is running first. That's going to then signal this to perform a leak at a given time. I, hmm. I think what I want so this, this function actually costs a lot of spin up and I might want to put a closure that's closer in there that can then do something. That'll change the state and I'll change this state machine a little bit more. I think this will be more correct. So I'm going to go into that code base, which you can't see. Um, callback f. f is going to be a function mute. And that's just going to get called right before I do the leak. Should hopefully build. Yep. Okay, so this now takes an argument, which is gonna be like print about to leak. So now we have a closure executing right before we do the leak, which is perfect. I think that's right. There we go. Callback. Can't borrow as mutable. Yep, I need to change this up here. Mute. Okay. That should build now. I'm gonna comment all this stuff out. I'm gonna grab these lines, put them here. Okay. Ah, uh, PT bits. We'll put that in there too. I'm just trying to clean up some of these warnings and errors. Trying to cut down on some of this noise. Oops. Okay, and then this. We're not using the II. Here. Hey, there we go. Okay. About to leak, perfect. So that's getting called right before, right before it's about to perform the actual leak. That'll get inlined, which should be nice. And so I'll go down here, swap those things in, and I'm gonna change the state machine. I'm gonna start the leak first. So we're gonna go into state leak. That'll be the initial state. That'll go into leaking. And then uh, we're going to want to put that into activity here. Right when we're about to leak, we're going to put this into activity. That will then cause that to kick off this thread, which will then put it into a... Um, Hmm. 
Hmm. We're not using leaked anymore, I don't think. So we're gonna do, that's gonna go into activity, activity, um, that needs to swap it into a new state. Actually, we could just leave it in activity. While this is not an activity, while load is not equal to activity, so it will stay in activity. So we'll come in here, we'll start off in leak, that will cause this to put it into leaking. This will then transition it from leaking to state activity. That will then cause this to get released, which will then run through here. And then at the very end of this, load ordering, we'll just put this in store mode. We'll store uh, state um, activity done. So load that, wait for that, it will stay in activity, then we'll put in an activity done. Once activity done is hit, we know that that's blocking for our, a new activity because it will loop around. That means up here, that kick that off, that will cause that to change. Then down here, we'll just do a while state.compare and swap state activity done with state leak. Okay. Hey. We have got one value. Okay, so let's cut down on this loop. So the leak's probably happening too soon. The leak's probably happening like 70 cycles before. Wow, we're seeing both? Holy shit. Like all we're doing here we're waiting for this, and then we're writing these both in. Then we're setting activity done. That will then cause this to be blocking again. That will cause this to come up and wait for it to switch back into leak state, which will do this, and then switch it back over. I think this should be cycling. Wow, the fact that we see two of those is really cool. Okay. This delay is pointless. I want to put the de delay in here. So here what I want to do is I want to delay um Okay. So here we're going to basically turn on the other thread. That's going to cause two memory accesses in like 70 cycles. And then I want to delay for those cycles here. So um, if I go to FF, does this work? I'm seeing both at almost the same rate. I'm going to let those accumulate for a second. Okay, we're seeing one more. Um, I'm going to, I guess I can get rid of this assembly. This, we still might see them. Because we might see loads that have occurred. I might need to do dummy loads. Because those have probably a... Those might be old, like outdated loads. Potentially. Um, uh, that's really weird. Um, what I want to do is actually, I want to I want to add a delay. We're going to always delay for 10,000. We're going to do 10,000 iterations of the loop minimum. And honestly, not getting those values. Love it. Okay. What about 100? If we loop 100 times, do you see those?
No. Oh my god, I think this is working. And then this, if we add one, if we add 100, we wait too long and we don't observe the values. Oh, that's cool. I think like 50 is gonna be like close to missing them. <laughs> yeah, we're missing them at 50. 30, we're getting close. This is how we're gonna construct this histogram. Oh, oh, we rarely see them. Oh, shit. We rarely see them at 30, so at 20, we probably see them more common, and now we're looking, now we're starting to see exactly what I wanted to see. We're like right here. This is where we are. We're like right on the end where we're kind of seeing them. And at 20, I bet we're gonna see them more frequently. Yeah, yeah, it's more frequently. And at 10. We need a better delay as well. We need a delay with finer grain control. This probably has like four cycle stepwise control. And yeah, there we see it a lot more. Oh! Science! <laughs> Science is happening! Okay, that's really fucking cool. Um, it's exactly what I theorized. Uh, I gotta start graphing these. I'm gonna throw some food in the, in the oven quick before I get starving, because I'm already starving, and I'll be right back.
All right, have we learned anything? Nope. Okay. All right, so we're going to make a new database, and we're going to call this, uh... You know what? Um, switching to uh, cycle steps. Load. Now we can delete this. There's less shit to scroll around. Cool. It's pretty straightforward. Much better. Okay, so we've got this delay now. Um, I actually just want to have this in RBX. I'll just do this, RBX and OXFF plus one. Uh, let mute leak mount is equal to II and OXFF plus one, or leak delay. I'm gonna put leak delay here. And then we're gonna trash it as well. Because the RBX is getting clobbered by our code. Deck RBX jumping on zero. It's okay, it's not great. Racks RBX. Technically, RBX doesn't need to be marked as a clobber anymore. Uh, leak delay. Value sign is never read. That's fine. Okay. Actually, I'm going to do that down here. I'm going to compute that there. And then here, I'm going to do like leak delay. I think I can just say RBX is clobbered here and I'm fine. I think I'm fine with that. Doesn't need to be mutable. There's a chance that I need to actually mark that as an output. Um, so on a leak print, leaked at this leak delay. Looks good, 256, one to 256. Okay, I'm gonna assume that that's good. Now, we're gonna make a B tree map of B tree maps. Um, outer database is keyed by uh, delay, inner database maps values to frequencies. Okay, so here I'll do value freaks dot entry leak delay dot or insert B tree map new dot entry leak dot or insert zero plus equals one. And now we should be able to see um now we need to change our pretty printer. We're gonna say for uh, for delay freaks for val freak in freaks. Print de delay this. Oh, I thought I had that first try. Dot iter on this will do the trick. Ooh, can't move out a shared reference. Yeah, I can't do the move there. Okay, so we have all those delays, and then we'll say 
if freaks.lens going to zero. Further reduce the prints. Really? Oh, um, we'll just do this. Eight. It's just because we have that filtering on it. Love it. One second, gonna flip my burgers. All right, how's the data look? Okay, so data looks f fucking phenomenal. Uh, the issue is we actually need to add, with, a, with zero delay, we're still seeing the values. I actually want it to be zero. At the tail end of this, it starts to go to zero. I want it to be zero and then go up and then come down. So what I need to do is I need to impose a delay here by a certain amount of cycles. So it's gonna be very similar. And the delay in the first thing only needs to be relative. We don't care about the absolute time scales. In fact, we have no way of constructing the absolute time scales from this. So, kind of winging it. Um, here we're gonna move RBX 100. I'm just gonna cause, uh, actually do like 25. So we should hopefully see some of this push back in our profiling. Um, maybe not quite enough. We'll do like 50. Oh, that might be too much. Hmm. Delay. That looks similar to what we had before. Oh, fuck. I put this in the wrong spot. I was like, that looks basically the same as what we had. Chat, you're supposed to catch me when I do stupid shit. Go back to 25. I like that number. All right, so now I want to see... I want to see the delay... Uh, push down. I want to see like the peak. Oh, gorgeous! Whoo! How fucking beautiful is that? Look at that. We don't see anything until 30 in. And then we see it kind of peak up and then it starts to go back down at the end. Oh. <laughs> wow. 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 Ah. I'm speechless. I'm really happy with that. That's really fucking cool. Um Unreal. That's so cool. That is so cool. All right. On fucking real. Um Ah. Uh, I guess I'm going to just format this and we're going to make some scripts to parse it. Jeez. As long as all of this is in like a pretty fixed format, that looks great. In fact, um, 
Runner actually will do this for us. Uh, it's looking for uh, some stuff here. Start CVS, CSV data. I should be able to do this. I think that script will exit once it sees that for the first time. Nice. Uh, okay. Found special payload, uh, dumping to graph. Uh, raw data dot bin. Looks good. We're gonna move this. We want just this data. And then we'll add a larger delay. Let it collect data for like uh, 256 times longer than that, which is about a second. So this is gonna take, uh, it's gonna take a bit here. Actually, we can do this. So when it gets to FFFF, that's when we're going to log it, and that will cause the script to exit. So we'll be able to see the incremental progress, um, and then it will exit out. Where is it? Oh, yeah, I, I totally did that wrong. Whatever, this is fine. Um, attempts, I'm gonna print uh, attempts as hex. Just so I can see, just so we can see the FFF. So when it gets to FFFFF, that's when it's gonna print. It's actually coming here pretty fast. I think we're going to have data. I'm going to need a finer granularity on the um, delay because the delay is too blocky right now. The like decrement in the loop is probably like... Two, I would guess two to five cycles per iteration of the loop, so I can't get down to like a cycle of resolution. Um, I've got some ideas for that. I think I can get to half cycle too. Done. Okay. That's now saved, and I should have in raw data.bin. That's all of our data right there. Holy shit. For these cycles, we don't see the other value. Is that the first one we do? No, it's not. We actually see this one first. I mean, these actually can get reordered, so um, it'll be interesting to see what these histograms look like. Okay. Um, uh, prefix. I just want it to write that data. I don't want it to actually graph anything. Oh shit, you got my password. <laughs> you got me. You, you, you caught me. Okay, so we got this data. Can you give us a few sentences of what we're dumping? We're trying to dump all of the traffic through load ports on an x86 processor. So we're trying to see all the loads that happen on a processor, even without us requesting that they happen. Um, so that'll give us basically perfect knowledge of everything the processor is loading, including things that are internal to the processor that we shouldn't necessarily be able to observe. The biggest part of what we're graphing right now is we're trying to get a graph like this where we have multiple peaks. And the goal of this graph is to get histograms uh, so that we can see like standard deviations and peaks 
of kind of these values to try to bucket when the loads actually occur. So we have the contents of what is loaded, but we don't know the sequence of which the loads occur. So we're trying to apply a time domain to them right now. And it's a, it's a relatively hard problem. Everything here is undefined behavior. So uh, we have really good results. We're just about to start graphing it. Okay, so you have raw data here. And raw data, we're gonna wanna convert. Uh, we wanna bucket it by value. And then we want to, we just wanna load this up into Python. So we're gonna go into uh, sushi roll, CPU graphing, vim, parse, um, load seek. And we'll make another terminal here too. Okay, code's gonna be over here. So we're gonna open raw data.bin rb.read. Uh, we can do for line in, fuck it, we're doing regex. Import re, um, parser is equal to re.compile, delay, uh, white space, one or more, uh, number, is it D for a digit? One or more space, uh, white space, one or more vowel, white space, one or more, hex, zero through nine, A through F, uh, exactly 16 of those. Uh, space colon white space one or more another group of digits one or more <laughs> first try <laughs> first try on the regex uh parse load sequence oh Nice, <laughs> nice. What's the purpose? Uh, purpose is kind of undefined right now. It's just to get more knowledge about my, uh, more knowledge about the like internals of Intel processors. I actually have some intended goals for this uh, project, but I'm not gonna talk about those right now. Basically, it's more more information out of the uh, processor. Be right back. I got to flip some burgers. Yep, this research is completely unrelated to fuzzing. Uh, it's still, I would say I specialize in like introspection and, and kind of learning how things work. So this is just a different field of that for me. Okay, for delay, val, freak, and this, uh, delay equals int delay, val equals int val 16, freak, equal to int freak 
print Val Freak. Sweet. Okay, so that then allows me to make buckets. We're gonna look at a specific value, actually two. So vowels of interest is equal to, we got this one and this one. This will filter out everything else. If val not in vowels of interest, continue. Okay. And now I want to do um, hmm hmm hmm. We'll do uh, uh, buffs equals this buffs if that uh, if val not in buffs buffs val equal to this buffs val plus equals print or er, 10d that's going to be the delay and that's going to be the, the the x and y coordinates and each one of these is going to be a different uh graph different file i think i haven't really decided how i want to form with this yet um delay and frequency Put a new line in there for uh, pop, 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 val data in buffs uh, open percent d data dot text mod val write binary dot write data. Um. Up, up, up. What? 26. Buffs. Dots. Your items. Or not. I can just do. Man, I forget how to iterate. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Uh, iter keys, iter, iter, uh, iter items, iter, uh, iter, uh, <laughs> I think in Python 3 it's just iter, isn't it? You can tell I'm not a Python person. Uh, <laughs> what am I? <laughs> Python iter. <laughs> I want the keys, yeah. Dot items. It is iter items, but no underscore. Mm. Not stir. Get. Yeah, it's a stir in this case. Ah, oh, 165. Cat, 165. Beautiful. Okay. Um, sushi rolls, vim, um, plots, is there a way to do that in a Python 3 and Python 2 way? All right, I gotta grab my burgers, they're done now, be right back.
Okay, just waiting for this food to cool down. Then I'm going to take a food break in a second, but I think we can get this data out. Um, what's the format? Uh, plot this. I'm going to print that in hex. There we go. Do, 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 boo, do, boo. Plot this using one, two. Uh, we don't want to use lines. Uh, and then we'll grab the next file name. This using one, two. Um, genu plot. There's a way to persist dash p. Genu plot p plot load sequence. For some reason, I called it a Python file. Oh my god. Uh, and let me do a plot load sequence to plot load sequence dot plot. Um, and this will be set term x. Uh, x, capital X. There we go. Wow. That is basically what I wanted. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's clean up some stuff. Uh, set, um... Log scale Y might work. Set grid. Set. Okay, that makes it harder to read. Wow, that is gorgeous. Okay, it's not very well defined because the granularity on that x-axis is is trash. Um, but we're gonna work on that in a minute. So I'm gonna take a, a food break. I'll be back in probably like. 15 minutes. I'm going to try and not rush eating food. I do that every time I stream. I eat way too fast and then I like am just in pain. So I'm going to take a little food break. I'll be back in like 15 minutes. All right. <clears throat> Barber shoppers wondering what he's missed. Pretty much everything. We're we're at the data part now. We're just at the results. But we have some more uh, creative things that we can do here, for sure. Okay, so... Uh, Finesse wanted to know, uh, explain the plot when you get back. So, to do that, I'm going to use a scientific tool called Labeling Axes. Uh, X label we'll call it Cycles. Actually, it's not Cycles yet. Uh, delay. Y label. It's going to be the frequency. And that probably hasn't done too much. Okay, well, so this is the graph that I drew really early on. And effectively, what we're doing is we're leaking values from the processor. So we're able to view any traffic that is traversing across the load ports. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter if that's happening during speculation, if it's a faulting load, if it's completely invalid data that the processor shouldn't be giving to you. Uh, it doesn't matter. We can observe any data flying across this load port. <clears throat> now, what's cool about that is that allows us to see things that we're not supposed to see the processor doing. For example, we can watch the processor update page tables and a microcode assist on updating the like dirty and accessed bits. Uh, <clears throat> we can see that already rand. Uh, even though it's not supposed to read from memory, totally issues a load that has random content. So there's like, where is that coming from? Um, but since we have the information of, of the values, what we want to now figure out is the distribution of those or the timing of those or the sequence of which those loads are performed. Because knowing that certain values are loaded is is important information, it's not as good as knowing exactly in what order the values were read by the processor. 
when you can see the values that are being read by a processor, you can pretty easily deduce anything that's going on or you can steal keys. Um, there's a lot of stuff that kind of opens up as an opportunity there. So effectively what we've done is we've written a tool that on one thread we have, um, well, you'll get to see some of my new paint skills. Uh, so we have, uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll go to like this size. So we have we've got two threads running and they're on the same core. So we've got a core here. I should get like a tablet-y thing. We've got a core and then inside this core, we've got two hardware threads, even though they share a lot of the execution resources, that's fine. We've got thread one and thread two. <clears throat> and basically on thread one, let me double check what we're doing. On thread one, we will, uh, we're gonna call this the leak thread, or actually we're gonna call this the, um, uh, the, the traffic thread. Traffic thread. Okay. And then over here we have the leak thread. And I know this font sucks. There you go. That's better. We can change this one too. There you go. We got the leak thread and we got the traffic thread. And what's going to happen is this leak thread is going to uh, pause for a fixed amount of time. Then it's going to load value A and then it's going to load value B. And then over here on the leak thread, we're going to, um, oh, this is going to like wait for thread one to tell us to go. Then it's going to pause for a fixed time, and then yeah, 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 yeah. All the good shit. There you go. So then over here, we've got this thread, and this is going to um, start a CPU attack. <clears throat> Tell thread 2 to go ahead. Sleep for, uh, or pause. Pause for a dynamic amount of time. <clears throat> and then load... Uh, and then perform leak through CPU attack dot 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 log results. So effectively what we're trying to do is we're trying to cause uh, when this signals, oops, uh, we'll use a different color, we'll use this color. Uh, so when thread two tells this to go ahead, this is going to then pause for a fixed amount of time. That's fine. That should be quote unquote deterministic, although it's not, um, it'll, it'll vary by a couple cycles. Then it's going to load these two values. And the goal is here, is this pause for a dynamic amount of time, um, this will cause this CPU time to extend and contract based on some variable. I don't know if that's a plane going over or if it's raining real hard. Um, so then, when we perform this leak, the goal is that this dynamic expansion of this uh, pause amount will cause us to sample here if we wait a short amount of time and sample here if we wait a long amount of time and here if we sample in between. And what that means is that we can hopefully, in theory, maybe in practice, possibly, theoretically, potentially, possibly, uh, what we can do is we can take this count uh, this time in uh, whatever this is, uh, delay in cycles, and we can take that as an x-axis. And then what we can do is we can take the frequency of which we observe the different values. So we're going to leak random stuff. We're gonna, then going to record the values that we've successfully leaked. And then we're going to bucket these and make a histogram of the frequency of seeing a given value at a given delay, and that will be the y-axis. Um, and that's exactly what we've done. So we've run this, we've run this theoretical attack, and here's the data we get. We have, we see this value, the 77E142 in blue. We see that one, this distribution, and we see E4FFBA uh, in this green or teal or whatever color this is. 
uh, in another. So the X is the E4 and the plus is the 77E. Um, and we see a distribution, which is really good. We see that there's kind of a, a like a, an incline and then a decline here, and it looks like a normal distribution, which is very close to what we theorized we would end up seeing. Now, the problem is there's too much noise in this data right now that we can't really tell where the peak of one is and the peak of the other is. Um, and so effectively what we want to do, so this is showing the delay. This is showing the number of delay that counter that we had that we were expanding and contracting. Now the problem is the delay that we're using right now is just a uh, counter for a loop. So it will change the amount of time that we spend in this loop. Now a loop isn't as fine grained of control as we would uh, want uh, in an ideal case because this might be four cycles or so per iteration. And if it's four cycles or so per, even if it's two cycles per iteration, that means that the closest, the, the most precise that we can get is like a two cycle window. Uh, so what we want to do is now we want to construct a better primitive that will allow us for, uh, that will allow for us to delay for like a shorter amount of time and have a little bit more control over this loop. So to do this, I think I actually want entropy. I want noise. And then I can perform a measurement of, uh, of like a count in cycles maybe. Um, so I have to look into different delays. So we're gonna take this code. This is our, this is our delay code we use right now. We're gonna put this uh, up here and then we're gonna CPU halt. This will cause us to uh, halt the processor at this stage and this keep in mind since we're running uh, two things on the same core uh, we might potentially have some disturbances in these timing patterns so that's going to cause some issues there so we're going to move into rbx uh, we mark that as a clobber that's good we're going to say i want to delay for a thousand and here i'm going to do a um, let it equals rdtsc um, and then let elapsed to the time already TSC minus IT print elapsed cycles. Um, and we'll just do elapsed. Okay. So we've disabled like almost all the code that we were working on. And now, uh, 2000 cycles elapsed. 2114, I'm looking for how kind of deterministic this is, so I can do this, four and zero dot, dot uh, let's just do a thousand, just in case it's too spewy. We are on a serial port on this machine. I don't have a network card in this box, um, so I'm not able to record this data over the network. Okay, so look at that. That looks really good. Uh, Looks pretty deterministic in the delay time, which is important. We need that. And it looks like the, um, I don't know, it, it looks it looks pretty, pretty good. Um, it looks like the smallest unit is about two cycles. So it looks like a variance of two cycles is possible. So now if I do like add racks RBX, um, actually here we'll do this, um, 10.4, cycles per iter and then here we'll divide by 100 or 1000 as s64 perfect so now we're going to see it as cycles per iteration add racks rbx we got to get rid of that because we don't have the clobber set yet this will tell us uh basically the cost of each delay uh oh one cycle per iter that's pretty good wasn't it like 2,000 or something? No, it was like, a, oh yeah, it was like 1030, okay. So that's actually pretty good granularity. Um, that's actually pretty damn good. It might be hard to beat that. That's basically a cycle flat. Um... Huh. Huh. Well, that's not too bad for a delay then. What if we add some knobs? I'm just curious. 
Nops might not have any effect unless it causes an instruction boundary to change to be on a different 16-byte boundary. So this I would expect to be basically identical. Oh, that actually has an effect. Oh, that's really cool. Um, uh, sub RBX. We'll do sub RBX2. I guess this isn't accurate because it's still iterating. I almost want like a partial. I would really like to get this to subcycle. And I don't know if that's possible. Um, I don't think you can break out a loop without lining, aligning to a cycle boundary. Um, I could potentially JIT code. Jitting stuff would maybe work, but that might introduce a lot of noise. So I'm not quite sure. Um, so RBX1. So the other thing is I could do like some random thing and then time it. So I could try to actually get the RDTSC, the actual timestamp counter of how long the delay was. Uh, assuming that this leak happens almost immediately. Um, I don't know. We, let's, uh, let's comment this out and let's grab more data. Let's just see if it fills in as we get more data. So I'm going to speed things up a bit. Uh, if we take a look at our graph, we see that there's the data that we're really interested in is, let's say, in between uh, 30 and 70. So here we'll do... Uh, th 70 minus 30 is 40. Uh, 32 is not close enough, so we'll do 3F here. So we'll do 3F plus 30. So that will be 30. Actually, we'll do 20. So this will be 20 plus up to 64. That will be our delay window. And let's see what happens here. So now we're going to have more uh, data points in there. Now we could just let this run longer, and that's probably what we're going to end up doing in a, in a minute here. Although once we know the values that we're looking for, I can actually probably make this leak. Uh, I could probably make this leak about... Uh, shit, I could probably make it a thousand times faster, which would then allow us to collect more data faster. Uh, do, 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 just waiting for this data to come in. So we're we're sampling. Uh, this will have twice as many or four times as many data points in the area that we're graphing. So let's take a look now. That is now parsed, and hopefully. That is reflected in this graph. Okay, it's still all over the place. Um, hmm. Huh. So, I'm curious how much of this noise is, um, hmm, I'm curious how much of this noise is due to the, uh, having multiple threads where they're, like, racing, potentially one is getting delayed by, like, a different amount, um, so that's looking pretty good. Up to there. Hmm. That data sucks. Like, it's great, because it's ballpark what I want. Um, I, could, uh, I could calculate the mean and standard deviation on it. And, like, plot a graph over here. 
So, do, 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 do. and then see what that looks like. Um, this data might not be normal enough to really have that sort of ability. So, um, uh, GNU plot mean uh, normal dis. I wonder if there's a way to do this in GNU plot or if I need to do. Um, is it possible? You can do smooth? What is that? Onset table, smooth. I'm trying to think the best way of doing this. Okay, that's effectively what I want. Smooth frequency. That does some random stuff. Is that assuming that the XY bin has been a built-in? No. Histogram samples using a PDF. Uh, smooth frequency. Let's just try that. See what it does. I think we're gonna need to implement that like bin function. And we'll just open another terminal. Uh, Genu plot p plot load sequence. Yeah. Okay. Well, that with steps normal. Yeah, let's just, let's try this whole line. We'll get there eventually. I guess we need. We'll just grab like all of this. Hopefully this port's over, it might not. Uh, plots. This dot text using that. Uh, set print random. Okay. Thoughts. Undefined function normal. See, that's what I was saying. Load stat dot ink. Is that is that a thing? I don't think it is. Yeah, totally not a thing. Oof. This might be it, including the stat.inc. Oh, God. It's kind of gross. It's kind of really gross. <laughs> hey. Told you guys there'd be a lot more stats in here than, uh, than actual, like, graphing. Or than actual, uh, coding. Okay, so this should, yeah, so this just doesn't work. I mean, maybe I don't need that. We'll just get rid of it, see if it works. Uh, 102, no data block random. Uh, we'll go by the file name. Yeah, that's a uh, smooth. Yeah, all right. It's trying to get smart. Okay, so what is the uh, the distribution function? There's a like whatever the approximate thing is. Do 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 do. 
Do, do, do. Is that it? Is that it? That looks pretty close. That looks like something I've typed out before. Uh, so here we're going to do a plot. Um, describe by that probability. Did, is that is that correct? Special case when u is that. Okay. General normal. Okay. Standard is yeah. Where was the where's the good one? Do 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 do. Alternative. Finding the width of it instead of the deviation or the variance. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, dude, math Wikipedia is so fucking bad. All right, here we go. There we go, at the very top. <clears throat> this is more math than I expected to see. Yep. Uh, plot uh, 1.0 divided by um, set. Let's see, genu plot variable. I forget how you do variables. I think it is just set. User defined. Function variable name equals thing. Okay. So this is going to be standard deviation is equal to uh, five. Mean is going to be equal to 10. That should be everything we need. So 1.0 divided by uh, standard deviation times the square root of two times pi. I think that those constants, constants are good. Okay, um, times E, I'm guessing it's going to be a caret, uh, over negative 1 over 2, we'll do this, negative 1 half times the X minus mean over Standard deviation. Um, we gotta square that. Probably fine on prints, I think. Ooh, undefined e. Oof. Oof. Really? Really? What is it in genu plot? I mean, we'll just do e. We'll just do this. Not great. Not happy about it. Ah, come on. There we go. Give me some digits. Give me some digits. There we go. That's some good digits. Uh, copy, yoink. Oh, non-integer passed a Boolean operator. Well, I have no idea where that is, so let's start putting these on lines and see which line it's on. 14. Oh, okay, we'll do that. That's not right. Let's start with just the ending part. Did I typo that? I probably did. Exp. Oh, yeah, probably, probably exp would work fine there. Um, let's just try that. Let's see if that works. Uh, plot 
XX. That's good. Is that the 2.71 version? I think it is. Yeah. And then this might be PAL. Uh, okay. Plot one divided by one divided by standard deviation times the square root of two times pi. Multiply that by x negative one half. Uh, power. To the second power, we want. Oh, that might be power of ten. Yeah, maybe it is. Uh, do do do. Need another paren here. Square it. Come on, plot x squared. Okay, yeah, that looks great. Why am I getting just a flat line? Oh, is it because my axis is bad? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, set X range 0 to 100, just so we can. V really? Really? A typo of something there? Uh, one divided by the standard deviation times square root two times pi. Let's see if that one's correct too. I mean, this is definitely, I think that's, yeah, that's fine. Square root of two times pi. Multiplied by that on the bottom. Multiply that whole thing by e to the e to the negative one half times x minus mean over standard deviation squared. Unless this needs some more parens here. Shouldn't. Squaring should happen first. Yeah, what the fuck? What? What? Um... Normal uh, PDF. Come on. Not seeing it. Density function. Probability. Normal PDF. That makes no sense. Mu sigma. C normal. Is that is that it? That's using the error function, but I think the error function is the same. Uh, C normal x mean standard deviation. What are these values? Square root two, cool. I'm glad we can establish that is, okay, that's the, uh, this is like the cumulative function, I think.
Yeah, this is from zero to one. This is not necessarily the one that I want. One second here, fixing up my that that okay. Um, see log normal, see normal. It's close to what I want. It's so close. See log normal. You know, oh, normal. It's just normal. Here it is. It's just normal. There we go. See, I'm guessing it's the cumulative. Uh, in square... Glad we could glad we could get that one out of the way. Okay, that works. And then that's really blocky, so we can do a uh, set um, samples. Okay, that's a nice that's a nice meatball right there. Set range two hundred. Okay, set X range. What happens if we don't do that? Okay, looks good. Set X range zero to 20 it means standard deviation that looks very normal to me okay perfect yeah what did they do sigma's lesson here okay all right well whatever it works uh and yeah up to eight percent it's good okay Woo! that was a hard problem <laughs> okay so now I can go through and I can kind of accumulate the, um, I can calculate the mean and standard deviation for these. So I could do buffs, um, who, uh, all vowels is equal to this. If val not in all vowels, all vowels, val is equal to empty. Then this will be all vowels. Um, vowel, uh, for freak in, or for blah in range frequency, all vowels dot append the delay. So at the end here, I should have all vowels. Now I should have, yeah. This will have all the delays and then the frequency will just pad those in. And now I just need NumPy, which I probably have. Oh, I probably don't. Okay, uh, Python, uh, Python 3 mpip install NumPy. I could also install it from apt. I don't know which one's better. Well, that was fast. Okay. So now I should be able to do for val in, for val data in all vals dot items, print percent dot 16x mod val, and then we'll print the uh, data dot standard deviation. I think it's numpy dot standard deviation. on data. I might have to make a NumPy array, actually. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, is it really dot STD? All right, all right. Yeah, I can use any iterable, okay. There we go. NumPy standard. Nice. And then numpy.mean data. Wow, those are different. It's not it's not statistically significant, but they're different. <laughs> um how do I want to graph those? How do I get those into the graph? 
Um, can I have it take just like the first lines? I could output these for everything. It's kind of gross. It's kind of gross if I just didn't on every line. Hmm. How do I get this data in there? So I could put it. All vowels val is equal to numpy.mean data, numpy.standard data, and then I guess I'm writing the values up there. Mm. Hmm. Can I plot a function from another file? Er, there's a way to skip a line, I think. You know what? I'm going to go the clue GUI and I'm just going to auto generate the genie plot. <laughs> just because I know it'll work. Uh, plot is equal to this. That. Um, okay, and then we'll do open this write dot write plots. Then here we can do uh, for each one of this, for each one of these files, file name is equal to this. Uh, for each one of these, we can do plot plus equals, uh, that's fine, with a space, plot plus equals, quote, percent s, quote, using one, two, comma, mod file name. I think I might need to put a comma out front. I don't know if uh, GNUplot allows trailing col columns. And cat plot load sequence dot plot. Uh, yeah, I think I I think I have to use commas, and I think I have to omit the last one. Let's see what happens. Might as well try it. Uh, function to plot expected. Oh. Oh, yep, there we go. What's the link for Discord you mentioned before? I'll get that for you, one second. All right, copy, there you go. Uh, did, 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 did plot. All points for y, yeah, we I can't have a trailing comma. Oh, God, that's so annoying. If, is this the best way to do this? If i i is equal to buffs.items minus one. If it's not equal to that, then plot plus equals comma. Dude, just support fucking trailing commas. If you ever, if you ever take a comma separated any anything, god damn it, support trailing commas. <laughs> it's so annoying to format things. God, this is so annoying. Uh len. Oh yeah, because len is a function that that you call on things in Python, because that's stupid. Oh my god. All right, there we go. What are you talking about? All points y, all points y value undefined. Oh, maybe it does support trailing commas. No, that's... You can do object dot under under len. 
JSON, I'd like a word with you. Ah, it's just so annoying. Okay, where are we at here? What? What do you mean, all Y? The file looks fine. All right, this is what it generated. Does it need a trailing new line? No. Plot that using one, two. All points, Y value. I have no fucking idea what it wants. Didn't I just type this out? That one's good. That one's good. Is it like this stuff? Oh, it's because the X range. I think it was too boxed in by the X range. Yep. Yup. Yup, 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 yup. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Okay. And here we'll do and and genu plot p parse load seek dot. GNU plot p parse load sequence dot plots. A plot. Plot load sequence. Okay. And then I should at the end here I can put in a normal uh, plot plus equals normal percent f f there uh, third bet variable x and that needs a comma after it all of these will have commas that one's fine Okay, so we have a normal at 49 and a normal at there, and then I need to normalize the the height. Um, uh, ba 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 uh, to g plot multi y axis. Set y two ticks. Move the tick marks on the left axis. Okay, that's easy. And then I need to do a Okay. And then I just need to plot set multi plot. Is that it? I just do the second plot. I think the second plot will just be done for me then set multi plots that's gonna plot uh okay so if i do another plot plot x i think that'll use the left axis yep and then that will use the y axis and whatever it's a little bit gross so we're gonna have a plot there and then here we'll do plots plus equals new line Plot space. Oh, uh, why is that using a different x axis? Hmm. Third line color three y ticks offset y range. Ooh, x one y two. There we go. That's what I wanted. I knew there was a way. Uh, X1, Y2. Uh, I guess axes. There we go. 
We're almost there. Oh, okay, cool. And then I need to associate these two. Um, that's really nifty. I like that. Um, okay, how do I get them to use the same uh, format? Uh, da, 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 da. Text color. So I can do title. I can set a title at least. Title percent s, and this will be the. Uh, this will just be actually dot sixteen x val. What? Expecting title for plot. Quotes. Okay. That's pretty close. That's pretty close. So we've got the... So I know that the E4, which is the star, is this blue line. And the E4... E4 is actually the one that's... I mean, these are... This is not significant enough of of like being split up. So now what I wanna do is I wanna go into making some new data. So we'll go into here and we'll change this to print the data a little bit sooner. And then I'm gonna add a small delay between the two loads. And I'm curious if we'll see this. And I'm actually gonna put this back to uh, FF plus one. This will give us a wider range, and then we'll get this data out and we'll plot it. There we go. Data's done. Exited out. Now I can go to five. So, like, that is significant. <laughs> and that is exactly what I want. Um... So we introduced a larger delay intentionally, uh, but we can't do that on a lot of things we want to measure. So in this case, we have the, looks like 77E is the first peak, and then the second peak is the E4. Cool. Isn't that fucking sweet? Isn't that sweet? And if we look at it, the first thing we read is at 1,000. Um, and that is indeed the 77E14. So we are now leaking a value and sequencing it. Um, we need a significant delay to get these separate peaks. What's funny is that this data looks like complete noise. I actually like this graphing stuff. You know what? We're going to make this graph even better. I want to use the same uh, style and color for these. Um, uh... Let me see if I can do like genu plot link style. I want to I want to use the style of like a previous one. I mean, I could just do like this, but line style. Oh, 1 2 3 4. I think yeah, they're just in order. Um I think I can do ls Uh, if I do ls1 for all these, will they be the same? Yes. Okay. So then I can do ls% %d, where that is the index of... How do you do an index of an array in Python? I want to say vals of interest. Uh, I want to find the index of a found... I can do find, uh, Python find array. Right, you can just do dot find, I think. Dot find val plus one. And then this will do the same thing. LS percent D vowels of interest dot find val plus one. Ha. <sighs> In, it's it's called index. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so now they're using the same colors. Yeah, I like that a lot more. Okay, so I don't know why it's this uh, shape. Let me do um, uh, set uh, term X. I think I could do like uh, probably like 1440 by 900 would be a good starting point. Ooh. Ooh. Is it this? What is the... Um... Yeah, genu plot set size. This is probably not what I want. Set size, set, set PNG size. There you go. Terminal size, size. <laughs> and I don't remember if that was an X or a comma. That seems to. Oh, is it because? There we go. I don't know why it's, okay, now it's good, okay. Sometimes it's like wrong until I rescale it, but that's fine. At least the, it'll maintain the aspect ratio. Okay. Um, sweet. That is exceptionally cool. Um, wow. Wow. And how far apart are these peaks? So this one is at, uh, I'm looking at oh, down here in the corner. I'm just measuring. Um, so the peak of that one is at 56.82. Uh, and then this peak is at 81.71. Uh, they are separated by 24.89. Oh! And we do our sleep in there. Our, like, dumb pause is 25. It's, it's... Wow. Like, that is so cool. It's within, it's if, it's within 0.5%. So maybe this is accurate enough to go sub cycle. I thought del the delay wasn't granular enough. So let's go down to, let's put in a delay of five and let's see if that is uh, quote unquote significant. Um, we didn't get the new data. Uh, we got to run this now. Boom, data, plot. Ooh. So this is 52, and this one is at 53. Um, and is actually incorrect. Uh, 7.7, 7, I think, is the first one. Now, it's possible they're, they're actually getting reordered by the processor. Um, so let's see if we can do, I, I need something to test. I need like a more complex sequence, I guess. If I do a couple of these and a couple of these, see what this looks like, looks like. These will probably be separate by their averages, their averages in that window. Yeah. So there we see the seven, seven happening first. Um, wow, that's gorgeous. I mean, the data itself doesn't seem to signify that. It's really hard to draw a conclusion from just the raw plot, uh, the raw points. But this, like, I know it's dangerous to call this normal, although, I don't know. If I did random sampling, it would make more sense to call it normal. Um, So I could try to pause for like a, a random amount of time. I, if I could get noise in here, some more like jitter, um, I could potentially get better sampling. Did I change it? No, I kept it the same. Um, but that's good. Like this is, oh, is this correct? This is saying that, this is saying that the E4 is the first one and it's, it's not. E4 should be the second one. Ooh. Oh wait, no, this is saying this is saying seven seven is the first one. It, okay, it is correct. I was like, holy shit. No way. Uh okay. So if we do a single one 
if we just do a single read, I'm curious how this is gonna look with just one read. Perfect, and okay, well that's what I expected. There's just so much noise on that delay. I wanna like get that down somehow. Thought you didn't use anything other than high performance languages. Python's fine for some quick script and shit here and there. Don't, I'm not really writing any code in it. I'm just scripting. I'm doing what you should do in Python. Don't write code in Python. It's a terrible language to make a project in. Um, Leak delay. That's pretty solid. Um, that delay is good there. That 25 I think was good. Hmm. How <laughs> best stream. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, okay. So yep, there we have some like pointers that we see. See that one getting low. Just that one. Okay. So what do I want to do here? Um, if I, I mean, if we just got more data. If we got more data, that would work. Um, so let me see if I have another version of that exploit. I don't. I don't. Um, hmm. Uh, cause once I know, once I know the values that exist, I can increase the rate of leaking by using a more targeted attack where I, where I know what I'm looking for and I could get the leak rate to go up, which then means I can get more samples in a shorter amount of time, which means I have higher resolution because there's like more significance in the points that I have, if that makes sense. Um, so that's one way that I could go about, uh, making this data better, um, FF. I could also like get the time. I could do an RDTSC here and then an RDTSC later. Um, let's start is RDTSC uh, time. Actually, we'll do CPU RDTSC. And then down here, we're going to do it again. Uh, leak delay is equal to uh, RDTSC minus start. Um, just make that mutable. That'll cause that to get updated. So it will use the old count. It's kind of gross code. Like, don't write code like that. Um, now I'm going to be using an actual cycle count. So the, uh, the count's going to be in cycles. And that looks like that might work. Uh, these numbers are going to be bigger. That's fine. Um, in fact, I probably want to do it. You know, I'm actually okay with that. I'm fine with that. All of our code can handle it being in like a completely different time area, domainy, placey, thingy, thingy, Bobby. Okay, so now we're actually looking at actual cycles, and then I'm going to put a couple of these and a couple of eights. There are two values, and we're going to see uh, how this looks. Nice, okay. So now the x-axis is actually in cycles. Um, I don't like these massive outliers here, uh, kind of annoying, but these peaks are separate. So this peak is at, uh, it actually, does it print it out? I actually kind of want to print out the information there. Uh, this is fine. Okay. So it's actually interesting that sometimes we see these shadowed here, um, I actually think I want to flush out the load ports intentionally. So at the very end of the case, I think I want to do a couple loads of like 0, 8, 10, 
18 just to cause different things to get loaded in there to make sure that the previous values get evicted. Hopefully this will cut down on seeing these numbers in the 3000 range. Uh, Cause I don't like having that much of a spread and it doesn't look like that did, uh, it might've. So here are the 3000 range. That's the null page right there. So we're reading that null page and that's the value that we're observing. Um, boy, that's strange. Uh, I guess these frequencies are just bin too loosely now for the amount of samples that we're getting. Yeah, I'm going to go back to the old version for now. And we'll put that back in. That was a good test. I, I like this one. This one was good. Okay. Just kind of back to normal, not using RDTSC. I'll eventually want to get RDTSC working in some way so I know the actual cycle difference. And then let's take a look. There we go. We got the two peaks. Fantastic. And it's correct. 7-7 seven, seven is the first one. Um, and let's see what happens if we have, see if we just have two of each. Let's see if that's enough to tell them apart. With enough data, the standard deviation would hopefully drop. But keep in mind, we're like, we have two threads hammering each other. Um, and having two threads running can, I mean, that's two different peaks and that's correct. Seven, seven is first. Like, I would say that's. I wouldn't say that's statistically significant, but it's correct. <laughs> All right, let's try two. Or let's try one of each. Seeing separation here might be really difficult because they're, they can technically execute on the same cycle. No, they're different. Uh, oh, that's the... This is actually... Nope, 7.7 seven is out front. And I'm going to sort this Python dictionary so the ordering does not keep changing on me. Actually, shouldn't this be sorted? Shouldn't that stay? 7.7 seven seven out front. Oh, these, uh, we got to sort these. Sorted. Is it sort or sorted? That'll sort it by key, if I'm not mistaken, right? So now 7.7 seven is always the blue one, um, and it is first, which is good. So that's interesting. Uh, these are, we have no separation between these two loads, and we're, oh, did we run it? We might not have run it. Okay. Yeah, here we have the overlap, but this one is still technically ahead. Um, and I want to draw... I want to draw a vertical line in Genioplot. Um, how to draw a vertical line. Alternatively, you can do that. The f These are all some hacks. Draw a vertical line from the bottom to the top of the graph at x equals 3. Use this. Ah, uh, from three, graph zero to three, graph one, no head. Uh, 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 can I only do one of those? Can I do multiple of these? Uh, I'll do five. Uh, we'll put this at 30. We'll put this one at 30. Well, I'll be damned. I could also do like a thousand X. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that model because then I can do this. So I'm gonna do plot plus equals um, big number times X. Uh, actually, can I do that? No. I would have to subtract off the slope. Um, so like if I did, if I did a thousand times X, uh, 
If I did a thousand times x, I just want to see, okay, that's that, and then if I subtract the x that I'm interested in, so let's say 30,000, 30, this should have something that crosses through the x-axis at 30, at 0, x is 0 at 30. Perfect. Okay. Why is this? Oh, because that's on a different axis. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, so I could do like this, million, 30 million. Let's see. Is that? Oh, because that's just changing the scale. Uh, yeah, okay, so I will have to draw. I will have to do the line. I don't know how to color that line. Graph one, set arrow. Genie plots. Set arrow, LS. Can I do LS one then? As long as I can color the arrow, I'm fine. Um, uh, where is that example? Do, 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 do. Where was that example? Here it is. Okay, that's on five. This LS1. I want that to be blue. Well, that just didn't work. Oh, that's because I put it at three. Uh, we'll put that at 30. LS1. Okay, that is blue. Okay, so then I should be able to do um I should be able to draw the arrows first then numpy mean data mu is equal to this and then I can do a uh, uh, uh Plot plus equals this, son of a bitch. Okay, this. Plot plus equals this, percent f, percent f mod mu, 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 ls percent d. Vowels of interest dot index val plus one plot plus equals plot space. Okay. Um, <laughs> there we go. So now we have a line through the uh, the mean of each of the points. And it looks like they are separated. They are separated by a non-zero amount. Now let's see how much that, how well that reproduces. Ooh, that one was wrong. This one is actually incorrect. Now I could increase the amount of samples that we're getting. We'll put this up. This will take longer to run, so we'll let this run for a, a little bit longer. Build it, run it. But yeah, I might bring in some code that will allow me to search for a specific value. I'm hoping this will be more significant. There's more noise, more samples. I'm hoping it will average out to be fine. Here we go. Data's here. Good. And this one is correct. And it's by just a, a tiny margin. That I would say that's 47, 46.76, 46.76, 46.76. 
47.25. You know, those are actually separated by about half a cycle, which is theoretically the amount of delay between two. That actually... That is really interesting. Print, um... Print value percent dot sixteen x mean uh, percent ten dot four f mod val mu. I just want to see these actual values. Uh, yeah, forty six eight seven, forty six nineteen, and the delta between those two point three one. Okay. Okay. And I want to see how well that reproduces, so we'll run it again. I'm pretty sure if I can just get the data in a thousand times faster, which I can if I know the values that I'm searching for, um, then all these problems go away because I just get much higher accuracy on my, like I get more samples the frequencies will be much better. We're getting a decent amount of data points, but keep in mind we're trying to we're trying to sequence two loads that are half a cycle apart. Like we're working in the in the weeds right now. Um, the fact that this works at all is is pretty incredible. Uh, let's see what this one says. This one's wrong by a pretty significant margin. Okay. Well, that's some data. So in a different run, it's, it's, it's way off. It's way off. It's off by like over a cycle. Okay. Um, I want to do a CPU Intel pig oh, X a thousand. I want to see what happens here. I want to get some actual data that I don't know about. Um, and I'm going to drop our number of samples so we don't have to wait as long. Okay. Okay, so we have our two values in here. Um, they're kind of all over the place. They're like really all over the place. Man, I, I need a better timing oracle than I think what I'm doing right now. I mean, the fact that this does work is, is impressive. Um, we can see there's more delay now. Uh, let's take a look at uh, raw data. Let's take a look at, this looks like the page table entry. Maybe? No, that's a pointer. Oh, that's a page table entry. That's a non-executable memory at 766 uh, user. That's the last level page table entry. So we're gonna put this as a value of interest just to see. Wow, clearly that one's happening sooner. That's the last level, and then this uh, this one will be a higher level page table entry. So we can take a look at this one. And yeah, Teal, we see Teal get access first. That's gorgeous. So like these one cycle apart, it's gonna be really hard to ever differentiate those. Does that indicate that in the case that they are mostly reordered or it's not significant enough? Yeah, I think so. Here, you wanna see a dependent load? We'll do this. We're gonna do a load of a thousand, let val is equal to this. And then we're gonna load that plus 
uh, Val and OXFFF, uh, times 4096 to make sure the prefetcher doesn't predict the access ordering. Um, uh, dot offset val, we'll make these I sizes. So now it's a dependent load where the previous load has to execute first because this is going to take the bottom part of whatever is loaded from the contents and use that as an offset. Uh, and I did some stuff wrong here. Prints, 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 prints. And multiplying by 4096 is overkill because they're I sizes, but it doesn't matter. That memory is valid, so I don't care. Okay. Oh, yeah, now we're not seeing an access of the other value. Uh, what I need to do is I need to write that in. In fact, I can just end this with, like, one. Mm, multiply that. Uh, just end it by one. And what's the final bit? Final bit is this. Uh, we're going to make that a one. So now it's dependent, and it should be uh, val and one. Val and one will be one, which will then cause it to offset by eight, which will cause us to read 1008, which will cause us to read the other value. Dependent loads. Here we go. Uh, oh, I changed that to a five. So I need to go into this and change this to a five that we're interested in. And there you go. They're much different. And it's correct. So there it is when you have dependent loads. So yeah, they're probably being reordered. I think this, I think this works. <laughs> like I, I actually think this works. <laughs> Which is pretty fucking nuts. Um. Wow. 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 Uh, get diff, uh, CD. I want to get some of that old code back. Uh, get... How do you view an old file? Git status. Git. I know there's a way in Git. Uh, Git. Git view old file. Git shell. Head mod one of kernel source main. Okay. I just want this code back. Um. Here. Uh, this. Oops. I can just, uh, we'll do this. Set no number. We'll just copy and paste it from here. Set paste. Paste it. Set, set no paste. Okay, so I should have a virtual address, a vatter here. Uh, vatter as mute u64 dot offset one. Write that in. And then down here we'll read from vatter just once for now. We can close this now. Unknown escape. Oh, these are all like, I think all the, yeah, these are going to have huge amounts of white space after them. Oh, boy. Is there a good way to clean that up? Other than what I'm about to do, which is really wrong. Don't do this. I don't know a better way of getting rid of all this white space. I guess I could look for um, percent S space... 
Uh, white space plus at the end of the line replaced with nothing. Okay, white space. There we go. Percent S. Uh, white space, one or more, followed by the end of the line. Replaced with nothing. <sighs> Gorgeous. Okay, what are we testing right now? Uh, nothing. We're reading from Vatter, virtual address. We should write in that magical value to virtual address. And offset one, we write in the swap bytes version of it, and then here we read virtual address. Um. Um. Yeah, we're not doing anything with that value. Batter. Mapping it in. Okay. Uh, why am I not seeing the magic value here? Read volatile, virtual address. Here we're writing it in, virtual address. I'm just gonna load it a couple more times, just in case. Something, something's weird here. There, I see it. Uh, probably just a really weird alignment of the cycle count there, I guess. So in here, we've got these... Uh, oh, I want the... Uh, CPU or sushi roll kernel get diff original I want these uh, get revision head of source main dot rs is that not get revision? Totally was. Show revision. And here we just want, oops. Kernel source main. It's like, that makes no sense. What I want are these values. Uh, those get tabbed in. They were like here. Okay, cool. This should build. Yep. Nice. Okay, so then I want to go in and I want to overwrite all these. So we'll do uh, core pointer write volatile to the ptep. Bridge PTE, uh, PDEP, the PTE, ML4E, PML4E, PTE, PDE. Okay, and then CPU, or yeah, CPU M fence. Doing M fence here. Uh, technically, we're not doing the invil pig yet, but we will in a second. So I just want to see what values we're getting. Okay, I've seen a lot of the pointers. We're seeing the value we're looking for pretty rarely. Okay, so now we're going to do an invil pig. That's going to cause, uh, hopefully, it's going to cause a modification of the pages. And hopefully we'll get to see the order that that occurs in. Um, we're 
We're gonna need to give it more delay window now. We got a 4096. Hopefully that's not too zoomed out. Actually, we'll just go we'll go three up here. We'll go to three FF. Seven or eight times wider of a scope. Okay, and we see the value, which is good. That's exactly what we want. And then we want to look for these uh, these different entries. Okay. So we're ignoring a lot of this stuff. We're interested in basically these three. Yeah, I think that's all we want is just those. And then the final, of course. Tab, tab, comma, comma, comma. Okay, so we're looking for the... <laughs> there it is. And... Wow! Wow! Wow, that's fucking cool! And those, I think, were in order of traversal 543. So here we have this green line. This is the top level page two. Well, this is the PML4E. Then in here, we have the um, uh, uh, PDPTE at 047. And then here, this one is at 9307. This is the um, PDPE. Uh, we're actually missing one more here. Uh, we're missing the, we're interested in the final, the final. Uh, where is that? Oh, PTE is just three. Um, we might actually have just raw threes in here. They'll be towards the end, I think. Actually, they might happen afterwards. The update of the, those bits might happen afterwards, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to change the mapping here. I'm gonna go a little bit wider out, and then I'm gonna take a look at um, now that I've zoomed out. Uh, where do where do I do the mapping? Here, I'm gonna or in leet. That's gonna be the physical address. That I'm gonna have to re-update these pages. Uh, so we zoomed out a little bit, and we're gonna be able to see a little bit more data. And I'm actually going to let this run for the full time. We're going to put another F on there just so we get, because uh, this is going to, this will benefit from it. <clears throat> Man, it has not stopped raining all day today. How much rain have we gotten? And it's windy. It's, it's kind of weird. I can feel my house like shaking a bit. Flood watch in effect. 15 mile an hour winds. Yep, I can feel that. Dude, look at, look at this fucking rain. Look at this. This is unreal. Um, this is the expected rain. Almost an inch. Uh, almost another half inch. Another half inch. Another half inch. Another half inch. Quarter inch. Quarter. Like, this is absurd amounts of rain. Wow. And it's just continuously pouring. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. All right, that data in? It is, data is in. I'm gonna have to update this plot because it doesn't have the, the right numbers for these fields. Scroll, 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 scroll. Oh, it's off screen, son of a bitch. We'll pipe it to less.
Okay, so these are the entries that we're looking for. And then we're just waiting on this data to come in. Is that running? Yeah, it is. It's just uh, kind of delayed due to the pipe. Okay, so these are all of the different... Uh, Those are all the original mappings. And then the final thing we're translating, we're just gonna wait for that to finalize. And then that's already prepped. So we're waiting for this to complete. Is your allocator allocating backwards? I'm not quite sure. It, it might be because something freed something and they probably got freed in an opposite order of, of what they got used. But, okay, so that's done. Here we go. Here's our data. Yep, there they are. There they are. We see the, the top level get accessed, the next level get accessed, the next level get accessed. Finally, we see the elite, which is the final level get accessed. And then at the end, we see the actual value get fetched from memory. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> How fucking cool is that? That's absurd. That's so cool. And this is on a pretty wide time domain too. Like this is this is over the course of like 500 cycles is what we're looking at on this graph. But yeah, that's there you go. There's a there's a fresh memory access out of a page table on X86. That's so fucking cool. <laughs> that's so cool like i don't i'm not reading those values this is the only value i'm reading but i get to see all of them happen in the order they occur in and it's exactly it's exactly what i fucking theorized it would look like at the start of the stream it's exactly what i thought it was gonna be god i love when shit pans out oh that's so cool look at that look at that ah <laughs> nice 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 let me do a uh, set key left oh oh that's so cool wow I want to say I wouldn't have expected that but that is literally what I set out to do and what I plan to do, but I'm pretty happy with that. I think I'm gonna call that the end of the stream. <laughs> so hope you, hope y'all enjoyed. That was that was really fun. Uh, hope y'all enjoyed. See you around.